Okay, members, uh, we will be starting in about one minute's time. Okay, good evening. You're all very welcome to our full council meeting here in the Grange. And first of all, what I want to do is just to welcome Peter Donaghy back here. Uh, Peter's been off for some time, so we're delighted. And I had the opportunity to speak to Peter earlier on. So we're uh, delighted to see you back uh, at the chamber. Okay, can I? Then just take any apologies. So first of all, John. Yeah. Hi, Councillor Anne Fitzgerald and Portugal Kelly. Thanks, John. And then Mark. An apology from Councillors Victor Warrington and Robert Irving. Okay, thanks, Mark. Paul. Thanks, Elliot. Okay, thank you. And Adam. Councillor Garvin McPhillips, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Adam. Okay, we're going to move on then to uh, the minutes of uh, Tuesday, 3rd of October. And first of all, for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And I have a proposal and seconder, all proposing. And a seconder is Eddie. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, then take any declarations. Special council meeting. Oh, yes, special. Yes, we have the special council meeting on the 12th of October. Yeah. And the special council for accuracy, page one. Two, three, four, and five. Proposer Earl, thank you. And a seconder, Marty, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Which one? Did I sign that one? Did I sign that one? That's the old one. Oh, what about the special? Sorry, Mark, but could I put that just for reference if you want to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any yeah. Okay. Have we any declarations of interest? David? Uh, thank you, Chair. Item 12.1. Okay. Thank you. No others. Okay. Thank you. Then we're going to go to matters arising out of the uh, council meeting on the third and page one and two. Chair, two. Alison? Yep. 
Chair, just in relation to page two, uh, we've been asked to clarify the order of proposals received at the previous meeting. So there were four proposals in total, Chair. Uh, the first was proposed Councillor Crawford, second at Councillor Green. The meeting would be with SOAS only. The second proposal, Councillor Coyle, seconded by Councillor Maguire, the Trust and SOAS. The third proposal, which didn't receive a second, was from Councillor Armstrong, which was essentially two meetings, SOAS first, then SOAS and the Trust. And the fourth proposal, uh, which also wasn't seconded from Councillor Gannon, that the Trust would come in subsequent to the SOAS presentation. And then you ruled, Chair, that you would accept the proposal uh, that the Trust and SOAS would come to the one meeting. So that was the order of the proposals. OK, thanks, Alison. OK, moving on, page two. Page three. Page three. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of items of correspondence uh, for members. Firstly, in relation to item 4.4, a response from the Permanent Secretary in, excuse me, in the Department of Health, and this related to the concerns about the funding cuts for women's health services in Lisnesky. And I suppose the, the letter is perhaps setting out more concern, Chair, in that it's indicating the budgetary pressures are such uh, that it is likely that further cuts will apply in the next financial year as well. And the Permanent Secretary advises that he's unable to provide any assurances that the financial situation will change. OK, thanks, Alison. And Josephine? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Alison, for your report. Well, first of all, I would like to propose to note the correspondence, Chair. And uh, I, note, I note it with great disappointment. Uh, because uh, members of uh, the council did express great concern regarding the impact of uh, um, this proposal on the delivery of women's health services in particular. And uh, I myself highlighted the fact that GP provided uh, vasectomy services for men uh, has now been completely uh, removed. It's not possible to refer men uh, for this service and what that means in effect chair is that women now bear the full responsibility uh, of uh, addressing family planning uh, issues within the relationship um you know whilst i uh, uh, accept that mr may uh, does have to address budgetary pressures there's no indication in this letter that he is really considering the needs of patients and that he seems to be unaware of the very significant contribution uh, that GP provided elective uh, uh, services can have in addressing patient need. So uh, the uh, um, removal of funding for vasectomy services and the reduction in funding for other services, including women's health, will impact very significantly on waiting lists for secondary care services and will ultimately um, really uh, reduce uh, the quality of health care uh, delivery to our constituents. So I note this with regret. Um, I, it's, it's something that I would like to revisit at a later stage when issues relating to funding of uh, our health and social care system uh, um, when when the position becomes clearer into the future. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Chair. And Noli? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I also was quite disappointed by the letter. It didn't really address the question that we asked about, specifically about women's services being targeted in in this area. Um, everybody understands, <clears throat> of course, that the health budget has been cruelly cut to the bone by the Westminster Tory government. But I'd like to further ask the Department of Health whether or not the disproportionate effects on a rural community or any rural impact assessment was taken into consideration when imposing a sweeping 50% cut to this service. Um, cutting 50% of women's health service in this area has a more devastating impact than cutting 50% of women's health services in, say, the Belfast area, for example. Uh, this is because we already have the worst access to these services across the north. 
And if you combine, combine that aspect with a lack of public transport, rural isolation, and the highest poverty levels, the effects are felt more deeply and have a more detrimental impact. Um, Belfast, just for example, has a contraceptive and sexual health service, which patients can be referred to, which isn't available here. Um, general family planning services are extremely limited here. I believe there's one in OMA, which is not currently running to schedule as there's no permanent doctor in place. Um, there's many unfilled posts in the Western Trust area, specifically when recru recruiting for consultants and other medical posts specialising in women's health. Um, this service would also have been provided training in this area, and this, along with recruitment, I believe, has stopped. Um, the Listener Ski Health Centre, there is only one GP who specialises in women's health, and she has to cover all of South Fermanagh and some of South Rhone, Tyrone, uh, as far as Carrickmore. Um, cutting her funding, as I've, I've had conversation with her, is already having a devastating impact. Um, the waiting list have immediately jumped from an average of nine months, which was bad enough, to 18 months. And she did explain to me that demand for this service is increasing. Um, simple procedures such as coil implants, which can be used for contraception, but also to treat heavy bleeding, um, to prevent anemia, for example, ring pessaries to treat incontinence, now have a mating list of 18 months or more. Um, these are just some of the examples of conditions and symptoms that this service treats. Uh, she did explain to me that some patients have already reported unplanned pregnancies to the lack of this service. And as Councillor Deason, uh, Deason, excuse me, brought up, vasectomies are no longer available at all. Uh, which puts all the long-term contraception decision back on the women alone. Um, women's health has an effect on the larger socio-economic yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, it puts added strain on the economy, economy, welfare and healthcare providers when a woman doesn't get treated for her symptoms, uh, which are already overwhelmed. So it doesn't make any economic sense. Um, can I ask that they look at the cuts again, but with a rural impact perspective? Um, so, um, this area especially will have much more adverse ad effects beyond just the increase in waiting lists. Thank you. Okay, and you're seconding the uh, noting. Thank you. Okay, and you're making that proposal, are you, Nolan? Yes. Okay. Have you a seconder? Green indicating. Councillor Green. Let me go there. Seamus? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, it's uh, probably, unfortunately, not unexpected uh, reply, and uh, just but uh, very disappointing. I agree with everything uh, Nolan says there. Um, again, it seems that uh, the rural West and for man in particular seems to uh, always get the worst of every outcome as far as cuts and everything is concerned. Um, probably a stupid idea, but is there, uh, is there, uh, would there be any point in asking uh, somebody with a, a legal background, is there a case to be made that if there isn't equality in the health service across the north, that uh, there should be, that we are entitled to it. It's our right that there is equality. Now, if everywhere has been affected the same as this, uh, well, everywhere has been affected, but if there's services that's filling in in other parts in the big urban areas that's taken the slack in this that we don't have, uh, surely we are, we are being discriminated against. So I'm just throwing it out there. Is there, is there a, uh, an argument to be made to, to see is there a, a, any legal route that we can uh, go down and uh, to question these type of cuts that's particularly affecting uh, the rural west. The other thing I just wanted to bring in now, if the chair gives me a slight bit of uh, uh, latitude, is there was supposed to be a, a, a I had proposed way back in the old mandate about a kind of like a conference or a kind of a coming together of like-minded people 
to uh, see was there any ideas of that that could be come up with that could uh, help to solve or partly solve the the uh, deficit in health in uh, Fermanagh and her own um, with lack of doctors, lack of uh, uh, infrastructure, a lack of spending. Uh, has there been any progress made on that? So, okay. Before I bring in Alison, Seamus, are you seconding Nolan's yeah. proposal? Thank you. And we'll certainly check out that whole inequality end of things. Um, uh, Alison? Yes, Chair, just in relation to the motion that Councillor Green is referencing, we do have an update report on that coming to next week's PNR, which does set out a, a suggested approach and some options for consideration. So uh, that'll be over to members at that point. Okay, Seamus, thank you. And um, I'm going to take Adam at this point, just. Thank you, Chair. Another disappointing letter, one of many disappointing letters we have received, and, and I have no doubt we'll be receiving many more disappointing letters and the permanent secretary there has, has outlined um, reasons uh, for the cuts uh, due to the current funding situation. Uh, and the one thing that I will say about this, obviously, it, it's terrible for the community and it's terrible for, for people in the rural areas. But it's very regrettable that we don't have ministers or an executive to address these funding issues. These should be decided by our elected representatives, not by a civil servant with the greatest of, of respect to them. Uh, we elect people to make these decisions uh, and there's many, many more difficult decisions that are coming down the line and there's a serious lack of accountability at the moment that's being caused by the current DUP boy boycott. And it's a pointless boycott really because we need government, we need ministers and we need people making decisions and we need effectively people that we can properly lobby. Civil servants and permanent secretaries don't often listen to us. Ministers no matter which party they're from, whether they agree or disagree with us, are normally Sorry, more likely to respond. Adam. But I was going to leave it at that anyway, Chair. Thank you. Sorry. Gentlemen, take the conversation outside if we need it. OK, Adam, thank you. It's just hard to hear in here, guys, so please, if we can do it. OK, uh, we, have a, we have a motion on the floor proposed by Nolene, seconded by Seamus. Are we all in agreement? Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And just a second item of correspondence on that page, Chair. It's just at the bottom of page three, and it's the um, members may recall the council had written expressing our concern about the deprioritisation of the works in relation to the um, A26, or sorry, A32. And the, we had also uh, been invited to write to the Western Trust, emphasising the importance of this for connectivity to the Southwest Acute Hospital. So attached for your information is the response that the Chief Executive of the Trust has, has written. And I suppose emphasising, Chair, the importance of the infrastructure, not just in the previous investment decision, but in the current uh, proposals around the, the, the temporary removal of emergency general surgical services. Yeah, thanks, Alison. John? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I propose, I'm happy to propose notice, make, notice, make note of the correspondence. But I'd also like to actually thank the Chief Executive of the Trust. It's, it's a very good letter. It, it nearly covers everything that needed to be covered in, in calling for this decision, which is absolutely appalling to be overturned. Uh, last In last month's uh, Council, we got notification back from the Department of Infrastructure, which was kind of basically just brushing us off. But uh, uh, following up on that, I think we should really be uh, uh, contacting the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure again, reiterating our call and maybe asking for a meeting with him, either either a delegation or for into a full council or maybe through the auspices of the of the health uh, health subcommittee. But uh, and and basically demand them to come down here and meet us to speak on this because this is a highly important important issue. Thank you. Can you make a nice proposal, John? Thank you. Josephine? Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'll second uh, the noting of the correspondence and also second Councillor Feely's proposal. Um, uh, I agree it was a very helpful letter from Mr Guckian and uh, what he sets out is absolutely true, and uh, 
it is disappointing uh, that the upgrades to the A32 have not been prioritised in the way that they should have been. Uh, and I think the matter is of such significance to uh, our constituents that it is uh, very much uh, the case that we should write and ask for a meeting to see if we can't have this work prioritised uh, given the impact on the safe uh, uh, transportation of our patients to and from uh, the Southwest Acute Hospital. So thank you, Chair. Okay. Chair Sweet. Adam. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just to, to recognise this letter, you know, I think um, the Chief Executive of the Trust, Neil Guckian, might be very surprised to hear me to be hear me praising him. Um, but I will because when the Trust and the Chief Executive work with us, we can do good things and, and it's evident it's a very it's a very strong letter, very well laid out. So uh, I'd like to obviously thank Mr. Guckian for doing that on, on our uh, request. Uh, and uh, it's good to see a collaborative approach between ourselves and the Trust, and hopefully we can see more of that. It's very positive, uh, and hopefully there's more to come. Uh, and then secondly, just to welcome what, what Councillor Feely has proposed, I think a meeting would be very worthwhile. The, the A32 is obviously um, such a key route for this district, um, and it serves, obviously, connecting the towns, but also uh, the hospital as well. But thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Adam. All right. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Again, I would like to recognise the positive, strong letter from Neil Guckian, the Chief Executive of the Trust, in relation to the critical importance of the A32. You know, it's really welcome. And I would just ask um, through you, Chair, if uh, Councillor Feely might extend his proposal to include copying into this letter the uh, Health Permanent Secretary and also the Executive Office, because when it comes to re-establishing the executive and assembly, there will be programme for government talks, and we want the A32 written into that PFG for the next session. Thank you, Chair. Okay, John's in agreement with that. Uh, Josephine? Yeah. 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 Okay. Eddie? Thanks, Chair, and I might, might be adding a bit into it, if that's okay as well, with, with, with both of them. Um, just regarding the actual working out of the process whereby the F32 was downgraded was the health um the, the the historic kind of evidence or need for the road for our health healthcare in the area was that taken into account as part of their uh consultation at the time um could we get I, whilst uh, Mr. Guckian's letter is 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 very very good, it doesn't specifically ask a question on that basis. And I would like to see if we could ask the question was uh, the, the health implications of that road taken into account when it was downgraded. Okay. John, are you willing? Yes. Uh, Josephine, are you happy enough to accept? Okay. Propose all of those uh, additions by, from Barry and Eddie uh, are included. Are we all in agreement, members? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to page four. Okay, Chair, thank you. Just uh, midway down page four, a uh, response from the Department for Infrastructure. This is in relation to the Council's representations seeking uh, really a number of pieces of information in relation to the All Island Strategic Rail Review. Um, so the, the Department has treated this as an FOI or an environmental information request, but in summary, Chair, the Department is declining to provide any of the requested information. Um, it seems to be really on the grounds that because it's policy and formulation, rather than policy established and that any uh, forthcoming policy will be the matter for an incoming minister. There is in the letter detailed uh, a mechanism by which the council may wish to register our concern or dissatisfaction with this assessment uh, and that's detailed as is ultimately um, which would allow for an internal review of the consideration and then finally uh, there is a final right of appeal to the information commissioner uh, if required. Okay, Adam. Thank you, uh, Chair. And um, the first thing about this letter that did surprise me was that it was deemed an environmental um, issue because in the report in the All Ireland Rail Review, the information we're requesting is quite clearly linked as an economic issue rather than environmental. But regardless of this, there's other parts of the letter that 
are quite shocking to me. They're refusing to give the information as it wouldn't be of public interest. That's a ridiculous statement to make. We're here as public representatives asking for it, so it is very clearly of public interest. And look at the amount of engagement with the review in the initial consultation and through the next stage. People want to know about this, uh, and it's most certainly in their interest to allow for full engagement of consultation to have this information. This demonstrates to me anyway that the department isn't running a full and proper consultation because that information is so key to seeing why they made the decision to exclude Fermanagh in this case and exclude many other places and routes. If you want a full conversation, a full consultation, a proper consultation, release the information, let people see your reasoning uh, because hiding it uh, doesn't help. It's vital. And as I said, it's the underlying, these are the underlying reasons, these numbers that they're refusing to give for the current plan. They've also said it would jeopardize the safe space to develop and complete the documents. You know, to me, that's a bit of a joke of a statement. You know, they released the consultation. They, they have to stand over it. They've put their ideas out there. Um, but I think they're nearly afraid to back it up because I think the numbers might actually show that there isn't a whole lot of difference between the routes Dennis Gillen and routes that have been included. Um, and it'd be very interesting to see them. You know, I would say, in fact, maybe it's a wee bit cowardly not to give them out from the department. Uh, and I will say, I believe it was Jackie Robinson, the Director of Public Transport Policy there. She highlights um, the documents referring to methodology. But if you read them, they specifically refer to this hidden data. So she's telling us to refer to a document that refers to data that we can't see and that we have no view of. Um, you know, that's kind of ridiculous to include that in the letter because those documents were the reason for asking for the data. Um, and as uh, Alison quite rightly noticed, there, there is rights to appeal it. Uh, and I would propose that we, we begin that process and, and uh, appeal it through that internal review first and see what comes back through there. It might not come back in our favour, um, but we should do this because I think it's very much of the interest of people in this district. Thank you, Chair. Adam, are you noting the correspondence? And I'll propose to note as well as that proposal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Seamus? Uh, yeah, um, I would uh, second uh, the noting and uh, proposal there that Adam made. Uh, I think it's uh, we say it every month. I know I say it every month. Fermanagh is the forgotten county. Uh, it's uh, uh, the reality is time and time again we're left out we're left out of everything uh so uh yeah absolutely anything we can do to uh to get the information of exactly why we're being uh abandoned by uh, uh local well not local but uh regional government and then west well we know why we're being abandoned by westminster well not, that's too long of a story but anyway um i'll uh, leave it at that okay thanks seamus uh you've heard the proposal are we all in agreement okay thank you anything else on four five okay chair just on page five again a couple of items of correspondence firstly a response from the Road Safety Partnership, and this is in relation to the, the new scheme or the proposed scheme. Um, our interest is welcomed in that chair, but the terms of reference and overall scope of the project have yet to be confirmed. So as a result, there's no further detail, but uh, I think there's it's certainly clear from the letter that there will be a, a further follow up and engagement with us when those matters are, are clarified. And then secondly, a response from from DFI in relation to the speed limit at schools and members that expressed or the 20 mile an hour limit some concerns around the reductions uh, while it's not maybe explicitly referenced in the letter chair it seems to be just in that second paragraph that it's undergoing review um so presumably um that that is the main basis for the pause and then there's a schedule for both 21 and 2022 attached to the correspondence yeah thanks Alison Adam. Thank you, Chair. I'll propose to note uh, both letters there. Just on, on the first letter, good to see that they're looking forward to engaging with us, and I hope that does happen. Um, and on the second letter, um, the, the 20 mile an hour speed limits were, were a great success. I think that was without a doubt. I don't know if that needs to be reviewed. It was one of 
um, the very good things Nicola Mallon did um, when she was minister there. Um, and I feel like it's more a, a cost-cutting exercise saying it needs to be reviewed potentially uh, until a minister's in place to, to save themselves a bit of money somewhere. But I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Adam. Seamus? Yeah, I, uh, I don't particularly want to get into party politics of, of uh, pra praising or, or uh, not praising Pacific ministers. I do remember uh, writing to Nicola Mallon on why there were so few of these uh, actually coming west of the band and uh, particularly to Fermanagh. So um, maybe with her being from uh, South Belfast, maybe that was where her attention was, uh, uh, along with a lot of other uh, ministers. So, um, but as I say, I'll not get into party politics. But um, just on 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 this, uh, again, it was a it was a a, a very good scheme. Uh, the the schedules maybe it's just that it's not working on my. But when I tried to link into them, they didn't work. So I I um, I actually couldn't uh, read them to see where the where the <laughs> these had been located. So to, just to say that there, and so uh, I can't really comment. Uh, too much on it. The fact that the links didn't work. Sorry, chair, about that. We'll we'll get those downloaded and sent around to members. Then sorry, and thanks for highlighting that. Okay, Seamus, you second in the noting the two letters. Okay, thank you, John. Of a uh, uh, technical know-how that I couldn't get it open, but uh, if Seamus is beaten as well, then it's not just me. Um, I was hoping that Seamus was going to throw a snowball, and then I, I would I would back him up. But um, I, until we see the figures, having done a fair bit of driving the day that that motion was brought up, and seeing so many of them at schools not in our district, I still feel that there's an imbalance here. It will be interesting to see if there actually is. Okay, thanks, John and Len. Carly, just briefly, um, obviously, the I agree with members that there isn't enough. Of these speed limits outside our schools, I mean, it's hard to comprehend that in many of our schools, well, at least in a good few, there are 60 mile speed limits, you know, past the school gates. I know a school that I'm involved in as the Board of Governors escrow was that that was the case, 60 mile speed limit at the school gate, you know, and, and that doesn't seem, uh, seems unbelievable, but it's also the case in other schools that we're all aware of as well. Uh, locally, so you know, really, the twenty mile speed limit at a school, temporary um, speed limit, should be should be at all schools, you know, regardless of the speed limit uh, today. Um, I remember, I don't know who coined the phrase that twenty is plenty where people are living, but where where children are playing and where children are walking, it's it's most certainly plenty. So maybe it's something that can be addressed. But I'd like to think that a review wouldn't be about whether or not it's a good idea, but would be about you know planning the, the stage implementation across all schools. That would seem the, the sensible approach to me, Chair. Okay, thanks, Lynn. And Eddie? Thanks, Chair. Um, it's just um wanted to confirm that, yeah, I couldn't get on the link either, uh, so it wasn't a generational thing either. Uh, for the, uh, <laughs> uh, but it was more... It was more a question about the actual functionality of the system because there are there are applications that allow you to scan on uh, a document as a PDF and and attach those links. Um, they kind of after you've uh, put them on, is it is there a possibility that that's available through our system, or is it just a, a quirk that we can't we wouldn't be able to write that? Chair, I think sorry, I think it is available. But what I need to check in relation to this case was whether the links worked in the original correspondence, obviously, from the department. Normally, it's not an issue for us. The links are live, but we'll we'll clarify. And then if there's any issues regarding the wider functionality, we'll we'll investigate that too. OK. And Diana. I feel I must be an exception to the rule because I've got the links and I've got it open. <laughs> You know, um, don't mention gen don't mention generational, but you know it's <laughs> it, on the right hand side where the link is. There are there's the number two, and that's what I clicked, and it did open it. So, you know, I'm sorry if other members are having a problem. Unless my my system might be more updated, I don't really understand. But but I certainly going back um, to the matter of speed limits, I I would support 
the gradual introduction across the board for all prime, all schools because um as we know speed kills and i think particularly for our school children i think this would be something that should become mandatory um i think it's a matter of uh, the public getting used to it but i think it should be the way way we approach uh, safety particularly for school children thanks chair Okay, and so just so that we're clear before we leave the subject, you were the only one, Diana, that actually went <laughs> <laughs> say, Chair, we have worked it out. We can present it. Open yes, if you're happy. Not. That's right. Yeah. So, Chair, no, there is a mechanism. The link is working. So if you're in decision time, sorry, uh, for those of you who are on, just if you look at the right-hand side, at the, the extreme right-hand side margin, there's like a little paper clipper for Councillor Armstrong and said there's number two. If you click on that, touch that, then two letters or two links will come up. And if you touch on that, that'll bring you straight in. Seamus? Maybe then at this stage, uh, I could suggest maybe some more IT training. <laughs> <laughs> Julie noted. And David? Yeah, thank you, Chair. On a, a related matter, in relation to, and I know some other councillors might have looked at this as well, uh, a nursery school in Irvinstown had looked for signs we put outside the school, just school, slow down, just signage. And because it was like a privately run nursery, you know, the DFI wouldn't even look at it at all. Um, is that the case across the board or could we write a letter to them and see if that is the case? I propose we do that, Chair. Okay. Cheers, David. Diana? Chair, if I could come in, I think... Um... Possibly it's a case that I've been involved with and DFI, if it's the same one, came out and met me and when resources permit, they weren't allowed to put a school sign there, but they would put, uh, I think, some sort of sign for children crossing, but but not a school sign. So there was certain legislation there, but um, I think maybe it's, it's something that has been dealt with. And again, due to resources and time, um, unfortunately, we're, we seem to be at the bottom of the list waiting for that. Thanks, Jim. And would you be happy enough, Diana, to second David so that we could get that in writing from them? Yeah. Okay, members, are we happy enough? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. On page five, six. Thank you, Chair. Just on page six, a response from the Department of Finance, and this is in relation to the civil service regional hubs. Um, so members will be aware that there was the proposal for two in our district, Oma and Enniskillen. Uh, the letter sets out the arrangements in Oma and the users, but um, is highlighting that because of budget constraints, the project has now been put on hold, which obviously impacts on the Enniskillen project. Yeah, thanks, Alison. Mark? Thank you, Chair. And it's, it's in relation to this whole issue of transfer or, or really the relocation of civil service post to Fermanagh. On the forestry service call a number of weeks ago, I asked the forestry service, I think you were on it yourself perhaps, for information on the number of staff that they've, or number of posts they've actually located in Enniskillen, in Enniskillen House there, um, compared to the, the lots of big claims and big promises that were made a number of years ago, all of which have been subsequently broken. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the forest service have responded to that yet. So I, I don't think it requires a formal proposal, but maybe it's even that a prompt from the council to forestry service to by then, if information as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'm sure we'll follow that up, Mark. Diana? Uh, thank you. And um, uh, I propose to note the correspondence here and um, something I did raise, and the Chief Executive followed up. Thank you, Alison, for that. It's just um, there is a pattern emerging this evening of you know, where resources are being withdrawn, where Fermanagh seems to be particularly hit. It's quite ironic that um, Fermanagh is probably one of the hubs that's furthest from central cities like Belfast and um, it's, it seems to be um, the one that suffered most for where employees in the civil service could actually um, facilitate their work by working from home, which is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, of course, your footprint, all those sort of green matters there can, can be advantages, but I would just really appeal in, in, in view of all the items that have come up the GP services, the upgrade to the A32, the rail review, the speed limits in schools. You know, those. The, this is the fifth issue that has come up where, where funding has been withdrawn. And we feel particularly hard, hard done by in the West. So I just wonder, is it a proposal worth making that we review where, 
where we have where in the West that um, proposals have been delayed, resources have been due to resource um, constraints that um, where we can present a case as has been suggested to the executive office um, to to really fight our corner here to to get more funding into the West. Thank you to make that as proposition a proposal. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you. And Seamus. Yeah, uh, it's just when Mark mentioned about forest service, uh, my ears pricked because uh, this is an old chestnut of mine that I have been, and I did get them figures over the years, uh, very disappointing figures, uh, and I would uh, definitely uh, encourage us to keep at forest service. Uh, strangely enough, I had a meeting with the chief executive of forest service only a couple of hours ago, one of the most frustrating two hours I ever spent in my life. Um, uh, Forest Service was one of the, the um, departments that was uh, relocated to a rural area, which was Enniskillen. Uh, the senior management never, never came down to the new headquarters in Enniskillen. The, I did uh, get that, uh, find that out, out of them. Uh, Dundonald House was their original uh, place. I think they're still camped up there. Um, I think there's a bunker up there where they all hide in the senior staff. Uh, if you go into the forest service in Enniskillen, supposed to be the, the HQ, the door's locked. You can't get in. Um, one day I uh, actually, somebody uh, uh, come walking out one of the other department agriculture ones and opened the door and I slipped in and I went up and uh, there was these vast open offices that could ha house uh, maybe 30 to 40 people each, two of them, and it was deserted. It was actually eerie. And eventually, after I walked around them for uh, a couple of minutes, somebody came out from a side office and uh, they said there was two staff in the building. And this building was supposed to be staff and I think it was 90-something uh, people that had been decentralised. So... <laughs> It's it's a story of uh, the civil service, the, the top civil servants being reluctant to follow what a minister actually uh, asked them to do, and just not doing it. And uh, so it's a it's a it's a precautionary tale. You willing to second the noting, Chairman, and second Diana's proposal? Okay, thank you. All right. Comment on the letter as well. Um, as an OMA councillor, um, the OMA Connect 2 hub is one of six. And on average there, you have 39 users per month. This is very welcome, but I would be asking, and perhaps we could write back to Neil Gibson, the permanent secretary in Department of Finance, to further raise the profile of that availability and that opportunity. Um, recently, I attended the annual general meeting of the Chamber of Commerce, for example, and nobody around that table was aware that there was this facility in OMA, that we had an OMA Connect 2 centre. And I, I remember going over to the window and pointing out the county hall uh, and saying, it's over there. It's over there, but it was news to people. It was news to people. So I would like to see this promoted uh, more so that those average user figures can be driven upwards. And for example, I would ask the question, you know, like other public sector organisations, is the offer included to them? For example, Intertrade Ireland. If you lived in this area and you worked in Intertrade Ireland headquarters, uh, would you be able to work from the Connect2 hub uh, in OMA? So I'd make that proposal uh, of writing back to Neil Gibson, uh, suggesting and proposing raising of profile and addressing those issues. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Barry. And Earl? Thank you very much, Chair. Well, like Councillor McAdolf, I'd be a wee bit concerned here with regard to this one. Uh, and without going much further on it, I would like to second Councillor McAdolf's proposal that uh, there was more attention paid to this and that uh, we write back to Neil Gibson as the Permanent Secretary and ask him to do this, to mm -hmm. make people aware the population in general aware that we have this facility in our county town of Tyrone, which is Oma. Happy to second. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Earl. 
Uh, so we have the two proposals. The first one is uh, Diana's second by Seamus that we compiled a rather long list of uh, uh, services withdrawn, withheld and uh, postponed uh, that I'm sure would be of a, a value to be able, as Diana says, fight the corner. Are we all happy with that as a proposal? Okay, and our second one then proposed by Barry and Segna by Earl that we write to uh, Mr. Gibson and to uh, look to see when we have a service that it can be um, highlighted and, and uh, some publicity done around externally and internally in departments uh, for the usage of it. Are we all happy there? Okay, thank you, members. We're going to move on now. Anything else on page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, Harry? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Gurumil, just item 14.1 there. I would commend, you know, what Councillor McCann was doing last month to highlight issues relating to flooding and fentanyl and, uh, you know, what alleviation measures are in place there, all of that. Um, so following on from the recent experience of, you know, Newry and Down Patrick and Armagh, very highlighted, poured it down, you know, um, really bad experiences of flooding, devastating local towns and villages, devastating homes and businesses. Uh, I want to ask the following question. How prepared are we in our council area for potential flooding up ahead? Now, we know in the past, including the recent past, those locations within our council area where flooding is prevalent, you know, um, Individual DEA councillors will know this just instinctively. You know, um, Bow and Lisnesky would be two examples, wouldn't they, at the Fermanagh end? And Oma as a town has experienced uh, a lot of flooding in the past. Fintna, um, Carrick Moore, and Berra, and different places have experienced significant flooding in the past. So, if, can we be preventative about this? Um, could we ask DFA Rivers uh, for an update on flood prevention measures that are in place right now in respect of potential flooding in our community? And again, uh, remodeling in light of climate change was a phrase used last month. We could apply that here as well. What remodeling has taken place at this time in light of the climate change challenge? And then where are there community resilience groups in our council area, you know, are communities ready? Um, where are the sandbags kept? Where are the keys? Um, all of these questions, we need answers before the threat of flooding comes our way. Uh, hopefully not this winter, hopefully never. But uh, are we prepared and how prepared are we for uh, prospective flooding in the future is my question. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Barry. Stephen? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I just want to support Councillor Michael Duff and his comments. Uh, I think the people of Newry and Down Patrick and Portadown and Kilkeel, all them places were, were caught in the hop. Uh, and I think with all the best will in the world, even those who were responding just weren't able to, to uh, quell, the, quell the floods as they happened. And those livelihoods just destroyed overnight. And I think this should stand to warn us all, I suppose, you know, and have a look at our own place. You know, what way are we, as Barry says, are we prepared? And he mentioned, obviously, Fintna, who has suffered in the past. And then in the recent past, Castle Derg, uh, Castle Finn, uh, places like that have also suffered. So this is something that's getting more and more common. So we need to start maybe having a focused look on it. And I'm happy to support Councillor Michael Duff and his proposal there, Chair. Can I get you just to second, Barry? Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's grand. Thanks, Steve. And... Earl? Yeah, thanks again, Chair. Happy to support uh, the proposal second there with regard to that. I suppose that we talked about generation there earlier on and we had a wee bit of a scoff about it, but I'm going back here uh, in this particular town where I was born, raised and represent. You know, this town was hit very, very badly in the, in the 60s, 70s. And the big flood of 87 was when we had the flood defence wall put around this town. 
and obviously that's it's affected other towns and villages around us more so now rather than Oma. But with regard to what's happened over the, the last number of weeks, particularly with Yuri and Down Patrick and Porter Down and what have you, uh, obviously there'll be a bit of a focus there on, on those particular towns and cities. Uh, where do we? Where will we be in the prior, in the priority when this comes? I think that we need to be looked at again, and for with regard to the priority that we, that we have in this town, and in fact, this district and, all, and others have mentioned the entire district here. But I will be concerned if there's going to be a big focus on that part of the province, uh, and that we might be sort of left behind. So I want us to maintain what we have here, and that. We never see the days of where you're you're flooded year on year, and then and, and this time like where where I was raised and uh, it happened every year, so I don't want to see it come back to that. And obviously, Bira and Frontena are just two towns that have been uh, mentioned as well, and they have been flooded in the past. It's a it's a very detrimental and uh, devastating thing to happen to any community. And we, we certainly want to keep our our town and our district up to the fore. Okay, thank you. thanks, Harold. Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I do um, welcome uh, this proposal by Councillor McElduff and indeed this conversation, because one of the frustrations that I certainly had over the course of the last mandate was that whenever you were seeking action from NI Water and from uh, Rivers Agency and the various other uh, statutory bodies responsible for this, is that initially, you would have had um, blame being uh, associated with COVID, and then you would have had blame associated with resources. But quite often, whenever you were seeking action to be taken to help mitigate some of the problems that we have with respect to flooding, um, particularly in, in my own case in the home area, too often that was just put on the long finger. And I'm conscious that one of the last ministerial engagements that we had as a council was with um, Minister O'Dowd whenever he was in his caretaker role uh, in the Department for Infrastructure. And at that point, I think it was still the case that the department was holding under active consideration a feasibility study, identifying potential options for a flood alleviation plan within the Oma area. And I suppose if Councillor McElduff um, would be content, uh, I would maybe ask specifically where that actually stands at the present time, because whilst we got away um, uh, uh, better off than other locations in Northern Ireland at this present moment, this is a very clear threat to the livelihoods of people in our community uh, and it's something that we need to provide a real focus to thank you chair okay just before i bring barry back in i'm going to ask allison to comment yes chair no thank you um maybe just on councillor donnelly's latter comments i think probably the meeting before last but quite recently we had written to dfi and had sought an update in relation to to oma um, but I think in terms of uh, which essentially was saying that it's, it's still being looked at and there's some other options. I think in terms of Councillor um, Thompson's comments and indeed what Councillor McElduff said at the outset, I think there's a very real risk that the the very significant flooding that's happened obviously in Uri Down, Patrick and Porter Down will further displace uh, OMA in particular because some councillors from the previous mandate will be aware that in the previous scoring, Uri was slightly above OMA in terms of the financial viability for flood risk alleviation. And given the catastrophic events that they have had and indeed new places now have been introduced, I think there is a real risk that the planned works for OMA will be deprioritised. So I think in the context of if Councillor McElduff was amenable of that wider proposal, that we should be seeking a formal assurance that notwithstanding the, the need to rectify the situation in the towns that have been hit in the last week, that there will be a renewed focus on ensuring the flood defences for our own district are actually brought up to standard because the scenario, particularly in Oma, is very similar to what was experienced in, in sorry, Newry and Downpatrick in terms of the impact on business communities. And while the flood defences in Campsie have been successful, particularly in relation to the, the residential properties primarily, um, the, the town centre is a very high flood risk area. Okay, Barry. Yeah, thank you. Happy to absorb all of those uh, suggestions into my proposal and you know even the general issue of the dredging of rivers and the clearing out of gullies might seem small but in the context of possible flooding these could be life savers and business savers so what kind of a program is there for that type of proactive work and 
Councillor Thompson said it has a devastating impact on people. He's absolutely right. You know, and I just wonder then, who has the remit? Or do we as a council have involvement in this? Building up community resilience. Who, who does that work? Um, who's who's going out and about into communities and working with locally based community groups and sporting clubs to help them be ready? Thank you, Chair. Okay, and Anthony? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and thanks for Barry for, for bringing this up. It's a, a major issue. And God help the people in Uri and, and down that, that was affected. But I know in, in my own DA or the area I represent the people I represent the bow, the flooding has been a problem for for generations. Like, and I remember Alex saying here one day at a meeting that the, it's been there since the time of Noah and the Ark. Like it's it's just been I it came up when Benice was here too, she was on about it, so I just want to speak up for them. But the the a good resilience group in Bow with as Barry Self to mention that the Bow community and the councillors involved and I used to be involved in myself and they do do their best in times of flooding. Thankfully this time of the flooding it wasn't too bad. But one road was flooded for a day or two, but it's back passable now. But rural areas is getting affected big time too as, as as well. I know the major towns and the shops now it is very bad, but People in, in the rural areas be suffering serious with floods through school buses and all that stuff and home help people can't get out and all that. But a fairly good community group or resilience group that the fire brigade be, be involved and the, the um, to get the people out to the home help, just the local people. So I just wanted to mention that as well. And thanks, Alison, for the work we've done so far in the resilience group on the council. And one of the council officers just always notified me when there is flooding in both. So I just want to get, mention that as well. A bit of good news for us as well. Thank you. OK, thanks, Anthony. And just before I bring Marty in, uh, I noted on the news last night that uh, just as you were saying, Anthony, that the rural areas are are heavily impacted. The potato crop this year seemingly uh, expected to have about a 40 percent loss uh, in the potato crop, which will no doubt drive prices up in the, in the months ahead. So uh, those uh, fields that are flooded on just not just field but have a have a direct impact on us in the shops and what we can then access. Marty, each hey, and again, uh, when the flood uh, the flood protection schemes in Oma have certainly helped. I just remember, I mean, the, the overall problem being discussed a couple of months back was the fact that the layout of the river itself and the bends and the twists uh, to the north of Oma. So just at that time, I remember there was uh, talk about plans to straighten the river and just wondering where that plan had ever went, Alison, maybe if an update at some stage. Okay, yeah, uh, I think Alison can. No, certainly, Chair. It, Councillor McCulligan's correct. It was it was proposed at the time to be incorporated in as part of the Struel campus and that the, the undulations would be levelled out. The campus was of the view that it was notified to them much too late for the environmental or other considerations. So as such, that proposal is not proceeding. OK, so we have Barry's proposal seconded by Steve on the floor. Are we all agreed? OK. If you can. Yeah. So just on Councillor McAdoff's queries around resilience and the role of the council. Um, so technically the council's role in any such emergencies is really at recovery. But as we have seen in, in I suppose, neighbouring councils over the last couple of weeks, it's also in the response mode. So things like the sandbag delivery, the clean up and the associated areas. Community resilience in particular is something that the Northern Ireland EPG Emergency Planning Group which is supported by all of the councils, but also DFI, DFC, takes the lead on and council support. So as Councillor Feely indicated, we would have a support role, but it wouldn't be our core responsibility. But I think, Chair, in that maybe wider briefing, we can set out what the resilience models are, how those can be expanded upon and what the council's direct role is in it. And the only other comment I would make, Chair, having spoken to colleagues in the affected local authorities, certainly the scale of the demand that that has placed on the councils is very much in excess of what would have been anticipated. Yeah, thanks, Alison. OK, moving on to page 10. Page 10. Sorry, Chair, just on page 10, uh, we circulated for members' information, uh, given the discussion that we've had regarding concern about gambling and associated matters, uh, that the all, sorry, the all party group is conducting an inquiry into public health approaches to gambling-related harms. 
Um, it's a Zoom meeting. We've been sent an invitation and it's Monday the 14th of November at 12 noon. So the link has been forwarded to members. You don't have to register in advance, but it may be something of interest to you. Um, there's a preference for RSVPs if possible, but not essential. Just for yeah. you to Note. Just proposer and seconder to note that correspondence, John and Paul. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on? Uh, and that's John McLaughlin. Just for uh, a clarification there. Uh, anything else on ten? Eleven. Thanks, Chair. Just on page 11, a uh, response from the Department of Finance. This is relating to the potential for a windfall tax and the associated support for businesses. And the Permanent Secretary just noting that it's a reserved matter for the UK government. And uh, we have made separate representations to the Treasury on that matter and a response is awaited. OK, can I have a proposal seconder for the noting? Uh, Earl and uh, Roy, thank you. Anything else on 12, 13? Chair 13, sorry, 12. 12. Yep. Just chair at the top of page 12, and this was also something referenced actually at the Rural Affairs Subcommittee meeting last uh, week. So we had written to the Department for Infrastructure, and this was a 10-year uh, budget detail um, which has been received. We had also asked for a rationale around the reductions that have been applied in some information is, is provided to that. So essentially what's been provided, Chair, is what we asked for, which was global sums. But I imagine the Council may now wish, as this information has been released, to perhaps go back and ask for it at a more disaggregated level, either by division or by Council or ideally by both. But uh, just for your consideration. OK, thanks, Alison. Seamus? Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, well, uh, if it's needed to be proposed, I would propose that uh, we do that. We ne really need to uh, break these numbers down and try to get the figures for the Fermanagh and Oma area. That might be a very complicated thing to do, for I have tried to do it in the past, and I've been told that they only keep uh, the figures for the western region, but I believe there might be a possibility that we would be able to uh, uh, work out the figures ourselves if we if we got the overall western division sums so uh, uh, but just just on on um, a matter relating to, to this um um the resurfacing contract in Fermanagh uh fell through in i think it was September 2021 and as of today I am. I still don't think there is a contractor in place, which is over two years later. And if there is one in place, it's only been in place in the last week or so. Uh, so my question to the department, and I would propose that we ask this, if there's been no resurface and contractor in Fermanagh for two years, but there would have been money allocated for MANA if there had been a uh, a contractor to do resurfacing. Where did the money go? Who got it? Where did it go? And are we then going to? Um, sorry about that. Then are we going to uh, get uh, money in lieu of the money that we lost because of this mix-up that the Department of Infrastructure made by not renewing the contract? So is Fermanagh now going to get in the next two years of uh, uh, the equivalent of a four-year budget? I am uh, uh, really optimistic about that, but um, not. But um, so that th th uh, I would propose that we write to the department and ask that question and ask: Has this contract been been renewed yet? And if if so. When was it renewed, and then follow the follow the money then on it? Uh, thanks. Okay, are you prepared to note the correspondence, Seamus? Okay, thank you. And uh, John. Yeah, I'd like the second Seamus's proposal. Uh, no, I'm one, a, John. Sorry. Are you are you uh, seconding one or both of his proposals? Both of it, uh, the noting and the uh, proposal to find out if our money is still safe. 
that's the contractor one. And are you seconding the breakdown of the figures as well then? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's uh, two, two jobs that were being carried over from the very start of, of the last mandate. And, and they were recently done in the Air North area. And, and there was a, a well-known contractor carried out that work, you know, not uh, mainly from Fermanagh. They, they seem to have taken over a business in Fermanagh and had rebranded. So um, maybe they, they have got the contract now, but if the money's there, they're, they're quite efficient. And the work was even up to a, quite a good standard, in fact. There's no holes in it already. And so there are three months, some of them. And, and uh, if the money's there, I'm sure they could do a good job. So if we can track down this money, then we can keep them at it. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, so we have two proposals here. We have the the first one is to interrogate these figures that have been produced to us and get a more localised breakdown. And Seamus proposed that and John seconded. Are we all in agreement? And then the second proposal by Seamus seconded by John was uh, to find out who the contractor is, if there is a contractor in post, and then find out if we have a, a, a two, four-year budget uh, that's waiting for us and what money is uh, is owing to us. So are we all in agreement there too? Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. Anything else on 12, 13? Chair, just on item 13 for members' information uh, relating to item 14, 13. So you may be aware just on the 1st of December, the uh, PAC Planning Appeals Commission published on their website that they had now delivered the report of the public inquiry relating to the A5 uh, to the Department for Infrastructure, which I think is probably ahead of schedule. And the matter uh, now res rests with the department in terms of the publication of that report. So again, Chair, given this has been something that the Council has obviously uh, referenced in the past, we may wish to write to the department just encouraging now that they, they expedite their consideration of the matter. Thanks, Alison. And... All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, exactly on what Alison's uh, referencing there, um, it has come to attention that uh, the Commissioner's report has now been handed over to DFA. Um, as an individual representative, I, I, I have contacted Dennis McMahon, the Permanent Secretary, and asked what are the next steps? Uh, what is the timeline? You know, the case has been made convincingly, time to act, you know, no further delay. But I would propose that we do this as a corporate body, as a council. Uh, similarly, uh, and, uh, and just an update request, because I do understand there has been a recent correspondence has gone from the council to DFA, but just in the changed context to, to seek that update. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Stephen? And just to second that as well, uh, it is welcome that... The PAC has completed the report uh, ahead of schedule and uh, it's imperative that we as a corporate body do push the department now for a, a speedy resolution and a speedy decision on this. You know, for far too long we've been waiting on this road. It's been well debated in this chamber and uh, we can just wait no more and the quicker that we get a, a decision, the better. Okay, thanks Stephen. So we have the proposal by Barry, seconded by Stephen, that we write and just seek clarification, uh, seeing that we have a slight movement forward. Are we all in agreement? Okay, thank you members. Moving on to page 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, Debbie. Um, thanks, Chair. It's just under the uh, illumination of council buildings. If I can make a proposal, please. Yes. Um, I'd like to propose that uh, on November the 25th, the council buildings are lit up um, for the first day of the 16 days of action against gender-based violence that runs from the 25th of November to the 10th of December, which is Human Rights Day. Um, and if that can be in orange, please. And I'd also like to request that on the 19th of November for International Men's Day, which is a global awareness day, um, 
to raise awareness for the many issues facing men, including parent, parental alienation, homelessness, abuse. And this year's theme for International Men's Day is Zero Male Suicide. And it's also to raise awareness and to celebrate the positive contribution that many men do make in um, society. And the colour for that day would be blue, please. Okay, thank you. And Rashid? Um, I'll second um, Debbie's motion there, please. Okay, thanks Rashid. So we have the proposal by Debbie, seconded by Rashid, that uh, on the 25th of November for International Women's Day Violence Against Girls and Women, uh, we light up the buildings orange, and then 19th of November for International Men's Day, we light them up in blue. Are we all agreed? Okay, thank you, members. Moving on to 19. Thank you, Chair. Just on page 19, a response has been received from uh, this, the SPPG, but through the Department of Health, in terms of the um, if concerns that members expressed regarding the FINTNA group practice and the notification to return their contracts. And really, the Permanent Secretary is just setting out, acknowledging the Council's concern and the arrangements that are in place for the uh, advertisement of the new contract. Okay, thanks, Alison. Stephen? Thank you, Chair, and happy to propose a note of this letter. I um, suppose one of the questions we asked the, the, minister, the Permanent Secretary was, what are you doing basically to, to kind of shore up our GP practices here and what are you doing to kind of stem the, stem the losses? You know, and they the, the say here they've commissioned a, an attract, recruit and, rec attract, recruit and retain scheme. Now, I've never heard this before, Chair. I'm not too sure if others have, but I'd like to hear maybe a bit more about what that actually is. You know, a... Uh, I don't know whether we can have this maybe on the next health and social care group uh, agenda, maybe just for discussion, Chair, if that's okay. Yep. You making that proposal, Stephen? Okay, thank you. And uh, Josephine? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I will second the noting of the correspondence from Mr. May. Uh, and certainly uh, it would be good to have... Um, further information on that scheme and uh, to have details and uh, a breakdown of what the investment have, has been. Because so far, Chair, as you are aware, particularly in our district council area, we have been singularly unsuccessful in attracting, recruiting and retaining general practitioners into our, our rural practices. And it's with a great deal of sadness, Chair, that I have to say uh, that uh, Fintana Group Practice have found themselves in this position. And uh, how many times, Chair, have we as a council uh, communicated with the Department of Health regarding the crisis that currently exists in the delivery of primary care services? The fact of the matter is that the demand for our services, uh, we do not have the capacity to meet it. And that uh, has a knock-on effect on undermining patient care and uh, leading to uh, uh, very significant health challenges for our population. And uh, we are seeing also the outworkings of COVID, uh, the exceptionally long waiting times for secondary care services and uh, the, the change in acute service provision at the Southwest Acute Hospital. This is a matter of huge concern. Mr. May does not reference the fact that we have not in our district council area had the implementation of our multidisciplinary teams, an initiative which was heralded as being the saviour of primary care, yet we don't have it in our council area. And there's no prospect of it coming anytime soon. And, uh, you know, I feel sad for all the hardworking GPs in Fintana Group practice who have given such dedicated service to their patients over the years. And uh, whilst Mr. May references uh, the ad uh, advertising of that contract, I'm not hopeful that there will be a successful recruitment process completed because that has not been what we have seen historically in the recent past. As far as the trust taking over the practice is concerned, 
I would welcome that insofar as it means that the Fintana patients will have ongoing care, but it's not the ideal situation, Chair. We need to sustain primary care in its present uh, condition. So uh, I would support Councillor McCann's recommendation that we need to see more detail on that scheme and to push yet again for the implementation of the multidisciplinary teams. Thank okay. you, Chair. That was a proposal, Josephine. Are you seconding it? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And Seamus? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would have to say that um, the recruitment process uh, for GPs, uh, I'd be interested to see what this new initiative is, but the recruitment uh, by and large has been uh, terrible. Uh, especially west of the band. I have often said it before, you'd think to hear the thrust from the department that we live somewhere like Outer Mongolia. I don't know anything about Outer Mongolia, but I hope I'm not insulting it. But I'd say they're making a better effort of uh, getting GPs in the Air Health Service than we are. And I'm sure they're definitely making a better effort than we are to get... Uh, general surgeons to come to the SWA, because as far as I know, it has been 2021 from the last time there was an advert uh, placed anywhere to get general surgeons uh, to come to the SWA, uh, which is, is, we're almost in 2024, and then they're saying they can't get any to come. Well, you know, things change. Maybe surgeons would come now. You know, wh why not give it a rattle again? Why not bring in this type of an incentive, incentive that they're bringing in for the GPs and uh, give it another rattle? Uh, so uh, that's my comment. But when we get the trust in, and I think that should be asked and be kept asked, why are they not advertising uh, for uh, surgeons to come to the SWA and uh, the recruitment in general? is terrible and uh, again from Anna and Oma district is uh, is getting extremely bad service from departments from trusts and basically from everyone. Yeah thanks Seamus I'm gonna let Alison come in. Thank you Chair. Chair just in relation specifically to the recruitment and I know we've sent some separate correspondence into this effect and we do as has been referenced of the health subcommittee meeting uh, next week I know the, the, the chair and I attended the strategic development group meeting uh, at the end of, I think it was last week, and there was an update provided at that meeting that is going to be shared at the health subcommittee regarding the recruitment, sorry, the recruitment that has taken place, the efforts that have been made and the successful outcomes to that. So um, I understand that that will be shared and we'll certainly uh, forward that. It will obviously be streamed live, the meeting, but um, we'll share any presentations that we receive at that meeting. OK. Mark. Thank you, Chair. And it's just really in relation to the remarks just made by the Chief Executive in terms of that strategic development group. My recollection, Chair, is that group was first talked or mentioned to this Council in the early days, maybe late May, June, perhaps even July meeting. Yeah, just Sorry. talk into it a little bit. Sorry. Yes. Um, just in relation to the remarks just made by the Chief Executive about the Strategic Development Group, my recollection is that that issue was brought to this Council, I think it may have been the June meeting, about giving yourself and the Chair the authority to go on behalf of the Council, and then you would report back to this Council, and then we as a Council would take a decision in terms of our corporate and ongoing membership of that group. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't recall that issue really being brought back to the Council at all. In terms of you know this this is the benefit of it this is what we're hearing from it or this is what we're experiencing or witnessing within the group and this is why we believe we should or shouldn't remain an ongoing partner within it because whenever I look at that strategic development group I would have big concerns in terms of its membership and its its genuine intent um, and I think that's an issue I've raised before about the trust and the department sometimes I feel engage in exercises such as this both solely for the optics of it. And I wouldn't like to think the two of you, whilst I have every confidence in the two of you going to that meeting on behalf of the council, I wouldn't like to think you're going solely as an exercise to, to take a box in the eyes of the department or the trust that suddenly the council's being consulted because as a member of the council, I hear very little about, very little about that strategic development group and anything or if anything 
is decided at it. So really, cut to the point, Chair, it's really to get an update on whether that issue or when that issue is going to be brought back to this council. And then secondly, in terms of just your observations to date. OK, thanks, Mark. We'll go let Alison. Certainly, Chair. OK, so there has been two meetings. There was the, the meeting that Councillor uh, Ovens is referencing is the council had received correspondence to what was described as an informal meeting, um, which I think was in July, uh, towards the end of June or in July. The first formal meeting of the group was on, I think, the 27th of August. The minutes of that meeting were approved at the meeting at the end of October. And the trust advised us at that meeting, indeed at the first meeting, that they would be uploading those uh, to their website uh, when complete. I can certainly forward uh, those minutes to members um, tomorrow, or this evening or tomorrow, together with the approved terms of reference. Our reporting route for that will then be in through the health subcommittee, which is is next week, which then the council can take a view in terms of wider participation uh, or ongoing participation within the group. The um, October meeting, essentially, they received the presentation that I've, I've referenced earlier around recruitment and on winter planning, which will be included at the health subcommittee next week. The next meeting is scheduled for, I believe it's the 14th of December. And I, so the council can take a decision when they have reviewed the minutes and when they have reviewed the terms of reference regarding ongoing participation. In terms of the only other comment I would make, Chair, and it is noted in the in the terms of reference, it's not a decision making body. Uh, and I think that's that's quite important. And it's also referenced in the terms, the terms of reference regarding the ongoing engagement with the council uh, will be primarily through the health subcommittee. So we will include it formally there. OK, thanks for that update, Alison. And Eddie? Thanks, Chair. The Chief Executive has already kind of answered most of my questions, so thanks thanks for the clarity. And I look forward to seeing the terms of reference and, and the minutes from that meeting. OK, thank you. And Adam? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, looking forward to, to reviewing it and coming to a decision on further participation or not. Um, and I know, obviously, I'm... I'm the chief executive will probably be on that meeting. Chair, do you sit on that group yourself? Because I'd be interested, obviously, yourself and the chief executive may have different views and opinions on it. I'd be interested in hearing both of both of your opinions on the group and whether it's worthwhile participating in it. Yes, well, I go to that meeting with Alison, so I'm on that. Sorry, I meant the, the Health and Social Care Committee. Apologies, because it's coming to that committee. So, so maybe if um, you could yeah, pass on your on opinions. I can, I can attend. Thank you. Yeah. But that is a fair point. I'm not even in the country, Adam. So uh, that solves that problem. Um, there you go. There you go. Sorry, Chair. Obviously, just to say we can, as a matter arising from this meeting this evening, we can revisit at the council meeting next month. So certainly yeah. the chair will be in a position to comment then if he's otherwise engaged as he is next week. Yeah. OK. Seamus. Thank you, Chair. And um, it's just to come in, I need to apologise to uh, Mongolia because the stats show that uh, Mongolia has 38.6 doctors per 100,000, while Britain has 31.7 per 100,000. And I would suggest that the north of Ireland is even way below that. So Mongolia is far better service with GPs and doctors than we are. So. Thank you, Seamus. That's uh, left us more enlightened uh, in world. Uh... Yes. So we have the proposal by Stephen, seconded by Josephine. Are we all in agreement? OK, thank you, members. See, you always learn every day. Okay, anything else on 19 and 20 and 21? Okay, that concludes the minutes. Yeah. Page three, page three, page three replaced. Okay, we're going to move now to the special council meeting and we're going to take uh, matters arising there. Page one. 
page two, page three, page four, and five. Okay, we're going to move then to uh, confirm the minutes of the planning committee, and that was held on the 20th of September. So for accuracy, page one, page two, page three, four, five, apologies chair, I'm too fast on my button. That's all right, John. Okay, moving to page six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And the proposer, John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. In the absence of Councillor Irvine, I'm going to propose the adoption of the minutes. Okay, thank you. And Paul is seconding. Okay, thank you. We're going to take matters arising on page one, page two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And Barry? Just on page 20 there, item 11, 4. Um, you know, the 13 councillors who sit on the planning committee, and then by extension, who are the LDP steering group, I think that's right, isn't it? I, they, they would know the answers to these questions, but um, when is the next phase starting of the LDP? And I'm talking about the local policies plan. And, you know, individual communities, individual uh, villages and towns will have various requirements. Um, I, I'm very aware of some that uh, will be making the case for additional housing additional housing requirements in, in their village or hamlet or settlement or town. And uh, so what input will the community have? And, and when does all that start? The local policies plan, which will be succeeding the Fermanagh area plan and the Oma area plan, which are out of date as well, know by maybe nearly 20 years. So that's my question, Chair. Thank you. OK, I'll listen. Yep. Well, no. Thanks to Councillor Mcclough. It was, a, it was a, a related matter I was going to bring up in matters arising on the next set of minutes, but I can deal with it here. So I suppose the short answer is, Chair, the work on the local policies plan has started. I, what we are proposing is on Thursday the 30th of November, um, an in-person workshop for all members. Uh, it will be in the, the town hall and really it is to set out exactly what Councillor McElduff has, has queried, what the local policies plan entails how we're looking at site selection criteria and how members on particularly non-planning committee members can convey and communicate that to uh, community representatives, business representatives and others. So if members are content, we will we will proceed uh, with that workshop. And I think that will address a lot of the queries specifically on things like the community engagement and involvement. Those are already specified within our statement of community involvement. But I understand this is really now about the sites, the selections, uh, particularly where housing and associated matters come in. I suppose what I would say, Chair, but again, we'll refresh this at the workshop, a number of provisions um, and key assumptions have already been made 
in the plan strategy which has been formally adopted by the Council and it is a planning consideration now in all of the applications coming before us. So while the West Throne Area Plan and the Fermanagh Area Plan are substantially out of date, the plan strategy is current and local matters are now being, local policy rather, is being applied to local applications. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, can I specifically inquire about HOU01? Um, a lot of people are saying that there's a kind of a new ban on development inside settlement limits where previously there was an assumption of approval. But I don't think that's the case, but I would seek clarity uh, because I'm being contacted, you know, by planning agents and by potential applicants who are saying, um, I was of the understanding that I had the potential for housing development there. Is it being taken off me arbitrarily without my knowing? And are they now being asked to make a case, make a case for housing uh, as opposed to there being a ban? That is my question. Okay, thanks, Barry. Alison, yeah. yeah. Um, Chair, just to say, and this is something that's been come or has been raised to the planning committee as well, that's certainly not uh, my interpretation, our interpretation, or indeed what the statistics of applications and of approvals are showing us. But what I would suggest, if, if members were content, and particularly around HOU1, we could maybe do a couple of worked examples on the 30th. To and indeed, uh, happy maybe to liaise with Councillor McEldoff uh, if there are a couple of site specifics to show what it would what it currently means and what it would have meant previously. But certainly, that would not be um, our understanding. In fact, the feedback that we would be generally receiving is that there are now considerably more opportunities uh, for development than would have been the case under the previous policies. Okay, members. So we're going to leave that and pick it up on the thirtieth. Okay, we're moving on to. Um, Item number nine, then, and that is the Environmental Services Meeting of Wednesday, 4th of October. For accuracy, first, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And Debbie, are you proposing? Thank you. And have I a seconder? Uh, Shirley, thank you. Okay, we're going to move to matters arising, page one, two, three, John. Uh, page three, we have a proposal to have an abbreviated form. Does that fall within the policy, given that we have a residual considerations to take into place. Uh, Chair, certainly the my understanding is in terms of the request it does comply with the policy requirements, but if there are any specific shortcomings in the policy that members wish wish to highlight, uh, they could certainly do so. I might just defer to to John Boyle, just if John has any additional comments, but I think it's policy compliant. Chair, just yeah, just in relation to it, any, any report that we bring uh, in relation to dual language, or indeed any report, will be will be compliant with the policy. Okay, moving on. Page four, page five, page six, seven, eight. All right. Just page seven. There's an unbelievably interesting topic there, and it's the disposal of vaping products. And Paper H, as I understand, I went and sourced that today. You know, um, not being a member of that committee, but I went and sourced that Paper H today. And I see that in point two, point three, point seven on page three of that document, vapes fall within the scope of waste, electronic and electrical equipment. So uh, maybe just to ask, uh, you know, for kind of a brief statement on that, what do people do locally with uh, disposable vapes uh, by way of properly disposing of them? Are there opportunities in any of our domestic bins or do you have to go to the household recycling centre? Um, 
because they're categorized as waste, electronic and electrical equipment, maybe they could burn the bins, you know, they could be the cause of burning of a bin. So is it possible to get that update now or later? Thank you, Chair. I'll ask some Kent. Well, sorry, I was going to suggest, Chair, if, if you're content that Director John Hughes would be able to comment now, if, if you're content, Chair. Yep. John, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, in response to Councillor Michael Love's query, uh, disposable vapes can be, and as you say, are uh, small electrical items that contain the, a battery. Uh, we have facilities within our household recycling centres for the disposal of, of wee products. Uh, I think the probably the second part of your question is how do people currently dispose of them? Uh, and I suppose the, the answer to that is probably twofold. Many people uh, dispose of the, the single use vapes by discarding them on the street and across the district. Uh, and that represents a particular environmental hazard. Uh, and we continue to, I suppose, try and raise awareness around uh, the proper uh, disposal of them. Uh, some people will also, uh, and if, if it's small small quantities, they may well find them, their way into uh, recycling bins or, you know, into any of the other containers at, at households. Uh, but they are small electrical goods, and we would encourage people to bring small electrical goods to household recycling centres. Okay, and I suppose just on a on a, a similar line there, I had the opportunity to visit Oma Fire Station uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the key messages that I heard there from uh, the senior fire officer was about the um, two things. One, about um, paraffin-based uh, creams and so forth that people tend to have to use. And over a period of time, they can build up on night clothes or bedding. And they are obviously then a very uh, flammable uh, proposition to make a flame. Uh, and it's just about that you would be able to get water-based uh, equivalents of those creams. So it's about making people aware that they are that they can be very, very dangerous, uh, the paraffin based. And the other uh, aspect that he was highlighting was um, mobility scooters, all of those things with those batteries. Uh, if they are damaged or anything else, and it was on the news there last week about a, a person dying uh, in the house where a fire was started by these uh, damaged batteries. So it is very, very important that one, they're not damaged batteries being used. If they are, they need to be changed. But secondly, that these things shouldn't be left in hallways or where your means of escape is going to be blocked if a fire did start from uh, result of damage. So it's just those sort of things. But uh, John and I were actually talking about this um, during the week, I think it was, or even in the end of last week, about the lithium batteries and, and the uh, uh, prevalence of them now coming along. Okay, anything else then on page five? Six? Seven? Eight? And nine? Okay, we're going to move on then to uh regeneration and community committee and that was on the 10th of october so for accuracy page one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven 12 and 13. And Mark, are you proposing? Yes, happy to propose that, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. And a seconder, Alan. Okay. Matters arising. Page one. Page two. Three. Four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve,
All right. Just very briefly, it's the the ponding issue on the running track at Oma Leisure Complex. Has there been any progress made there? You know, in removing the tendency for the running track uh, to pond in the way that it does. It's it's even at the commencement of the park run. You know, the Saturday morning park run where people assemble, where people gather. That's where the ponding very often takes place. And our, our director had told us that progress was being made and that was welcome last month, you know, but is there any further update? Thank you, Chair. Chair, Chair yeah, War, work is still ongoing uh, and we would hope that in the next couple of weeks that all of that issue would be sorted. I have to say there has been good progress made to date uh, and in the next couple of weeks we would hope that, that the whole ponding issue has been fully sorted at that stage. Okay, thanks, John. Diana? Thank you, Chair. Yes, page 11, um, the North Fermanagh Valley Park Cache. Just to say thank you that and to acknowledge that council officers have been in touch to get a contact for that. And um, I'm pleased to see that hopefully work is, is ongoing there to, to see if the facility can, can, be, um, can be used more widely within the district. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks. Anything else on 12? 13? Just on uh, 13, we'd been asked, and I know there was some urgency indicated in DFI's original correspondence for further clarification to be sought regarding the proposed prohibition of the right-hand turn uh, and better mapping and so on. So that information has been provided and also included in the response from DFI um, is an offer uh, from Gerald Brennan in the network development section to meet with members to, to discuss the proposals in more detail and that perhaps, Chair, might be something that, that members um, may wish to consider. I know reference is also made within that to the planning considerations at the time, so we could certainly also have planning officers in attendance if there's any specific queries regarding conditions. OK, thanks, Alison. Adam? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, you know, the document didn't reassure my concerns from that meeting. I don't necessarily see, still see the logic um, behind it. If it's going to be such an influx of traffic that you cannot, that there's a need for no right turn. You're just moving the problem down to Jail Square and Dunn's traffic lights there or on the Belmore Street. And obviously the, the mention about concerns about the fire station, if you have left turn only, you're going to immediately make a U-turn then at the fire station, potentially blocking access and egress from the fire station. And that's if, the, if and I don't believe this is the case, but that's if the traffic from this new site is so bad that it warrants this. I, I, I know I, I said it at the meeting um, where we originally discussed and I said it again, it's quite normal to turn right across two lanes of traffic. It's done all the time in, in Belfast without much difficulty in much worse and busier road junctions and areas where there's so many junctions on top of each other, it's actually potentially more difficult, but it's done with relative ease. Now, I know it's not something we have a lot of in Fermanagh, um, and it does require a bit of good judgment for, from drivers too. Um, but I would also go further to say that on the exit, there should be separate left and right hand exit turns, because if everyone has to turn left, and then everyone's swinging a U-turn in front of the fire station, you can block it. So I, I, would, I would like to propose, Chair, um, before well, we might, I think we might come to a corporate position on it potentially. But I would like to to meet with DFA and take them up on that offer and propose that we do meet them, because I I don't think it can go ahead in its current plans. But maybe I maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's some wider consideration that that I haven't seen. But thank you, Chair. And are you happy to note correspondence? Thanks, Adam and Diana. Chair, thank you. Yes, I'll uh, second the correspondence and second Councillor Gannon's proposal that we meet um, with GFI officers. I mean, this is something I raised at the last meeting. I, I continue to have grave concerns about this because it's pushing the congestion further down from the west, further down to the cenotaph. And it, the, there isn't the opportunity there if you're if there's no right turn at that point. Um, where do, does the west, um, the traffic from the west coming into the town, where does it turn to go into uh, to McDonald's? Um, I have read some of the modelling and I know it's proposed to be more of a drive through. I mean, that behavioural change takes time. So there will be a lot of adjustment for users. I mean, while we welcome, um, while we welcome expansion within the town, I am concerned also that the traffic light system are also going to have to be upgraded. So again, we have 
roadworks potentially at that junction in the jail square. Um, looking forward, looking years ahead, there's potential that the ergs will move to the Devonish site, which has been referenced in this document as well, um, that it's the it states that there's less footfall coming from the Devonish College. But again, going forward, there will be hopefully a school move there in a temporary situation. And we don't know yet what's going to happen. The uh, former uh, Southwest College building there. So I still have considerable concerns and I would welcome this meeting and I will be participating. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Diana. So we have a meeting proposed by Adam, second by Diana. Are we all content on that, members? Okay, thank you. Okay, there's nothing else on the minutes on page 14. So we'll move now to our minutes of the Policy and Resources Committee, and that was on the 11th of October. For accuracy first, page one, two, three, four. Adam? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to propose that in, in the adoption of these minutes that we remove on point uh, four three point three uh, the approval of tenders, uh, the approval of the issue of tenders, bullet point one, the provision of ad, uh, advice services, and refer back to the committee. Chair, I will have um, a proposal that I'll make in, under matters horizon, which is the appropriate place to do this, um, but I think it would be appropriate to give me logic behind this at this stage. Um, it's just that the current funding proposal there is insufficient, uh, in, in my view, that if the tender goes out at that value, uh, for Manor community advice in particular would cease to exist. Um, they do take tens of thousands of calls every year, and I'm not over-exaggerating there, and, and we all here know very well what they do. Um, I believe the funding being offered is at the same as four or five years ago. Yeah, I think you, you know. I'll come into it in matters of advice, will I, Chair? I'm going to take this. You've made your point there, so uh, I'm going to take it on the matters arising there, Adam. Okay. Um, Bernard? Uh, I'd like to second that, uh, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm moving on. Page five. Six and seven. And Stephen, yeah. So, Stephen, you're happy to uh, propose with the removal at uh, point three there. Okay, thank you. Second. And we need a seconder who's seconding the minutes. Damn it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to matters arising. Page one, two. David. Uh, thank you, Chair. On just a couple of points in relation to the consultations. Uh, the, the first one is in relation to the, the Lack Primary School consultation, which I appreciate may not be action until after tonight. Um, just the deadline is the 17th of November. So I don't know if members will get a chance to see that before it goes in or what the story is there, Chair. First point. And the second point is in relation to a consultation uh, to do with the approach to 10x. Um, that come out on email there. And uh, I note that there's three consultation event details, uh, one in Lisbon, one in Armagh, one in Londonderry. Uh, disappointed that there's none down here again. It just goes to show you where we are. Um, and I'm wondering, is any of the council officials who may be partaking in the consultation going to be at any of those? OK, thanks, David. Chair, firstly, in relation to the lack consultation, as, as Councillor Matt has indicated, yes, once the minutes now have been ratified, we'll proceed to action, but we can circulate a draft in advance of a uh, formal submission. In terms of the 10X, um, again, Councillor Mahan's quite correct, the three events. Now, to the best of my knowledge, all three, one is tonight, for example. I think they actually all fall, uh, that they coincide. There might be one on a Thursday, I'm not sure, with existing council meetings. I am checking officer availability for one of them if possible. We are intending to bring a draft response to the um, a Regeneration and Community Committee meeting. Uh, now, I do appreciate the deadline for this is up at the end of the month, but again, members may wish to write to, to the department, just given the whole focus on regional 
balance or imbalance and the fact that there's been a decision not to include the council area as part of the uh, consultation process might it, it mightn't generate any uh, results this time but it might be worth making a point yeah chair and thank you chief executive i'm quite happy to propose that we do write to them and let them know how disappointed we are that there's not one in this area and that uh, i don't know if council powers are needed to respond to this consultation Sorry, Chair, 24th, that's due. Yep, yeah, we have it just later on the agenda, so we will be getting that later on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. And Earl. Thank you, Chair. And following on from Councillor Mahan, uh, I'm happy to second his proposal. Uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're overlooked by, I don't know why, because we're the largest council area in Northern Ireland, and why we're left out of these, these uh, events that are taking place is beyond me. Uh, but I think it, as Councillor Mahan has already pointed out, that needs seriously reinforced as to why, why we're being left out all the time from Alan Oma District Council area. Thank you. And this is unfortunately not a new phenomenon because yep. uh, back from 20 years ago in uh, Fermanagh Council, I'm sure Oma was uh, similar. Uh, we were left out of these things and we always had to travel to, to all of them. Okay. We have our proposal by David Segner by Earl. Uh, are we all agreed, members? Yep, I think that can go down and Diana's list there as well uh, as another uh, aspect of uh, being left out. Okay, moving on. Anything else on two, three, four? Just on three, if I may. Yeah. Chair, apologies. Just on three to confirm to members, in, and I know the invitation is issued, but we were able to resolve matters. So the first estimates workshop will take place at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 29th of November. We thought there may need uh, that date to be changed, but that is now in place. Thank you. OK. And Adam? Thank you, Chair. On page four, just to make the proposal related to the uh, community advice. I would like just to give very briefly a couple of, of the numbers. I know some councillors are aware of, of the financial situation um, that in particular for Manor Community Advice are facing. Currently, they, they're just unsustainable. Uh, they're burning through reserves just to survive. They won't sur they, it just won't survive another year under the current funding model um, with an approximate £50,000 annual deficit. Uh, currently, and when you put that into perspective, we their budget is mainly the £150,000 we give them. Now, they are trying to get other funding, they're fundraising, they're playing for funds like every other group is, but the, every other group's going for it at the minute. So there, is, there isn't that much out there. Uh, and as I've said, they are such an invaluable community resource. They're understaffed as it stands. They can't deal with the community demand. Uh, and the community demand's increasing. You know, everyone here knows due to inflation and cost of living crisis, we've all here had more queries. And I know, in, in, at least the Fermanagh Council, I've probably all at some stage referred someone to Fermanagh Community Advice. Uh, and just to highlight that it's beyond phone calls, there's obviously physical office, but staff, uh, just to mention them, by, such as Samantha Gallagher, Bernie Maguire, some of you know them, do a fantastic job highlighting for mana specific issues such as uh, just to give one as an example the fact that some of the cost of living support payments in regards to energy weren't going to people in for mana because of postcodes which we discussed at length in this chamber um, and i think we need to give serious consideration to the funding mod model as it would be in my opinion dreadful uh, to let this uh, community advice go uh, if we can save it by just adjusting our budgets slightly and i know it'll take adjustment that we don't have money coming out of everywhere we're going to have to, to move money to make something happen so i would like to propose um that prior to being reconsidered in committee that uh, a report is brought back to the committee uh, considering funding provision um including uh the detail of payment uh, when it was first what was the values that were given four or five four or five years ago when it was tendered out last uh, what a rise in line with inflation would mean financially for us and how we would finance such a such a, a move. What Fermanagh Community Advice feel they require to be sustainable so an officer would have to contact them to find out what they feel. So this is just to give us a few different options, Chair, and, and any other option that officers feel would be appropriate to, to potentially include in that. Um, and I'll leave that proposal there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. And I just... Yet, Chair, just to note that we can certainly, uh, in terms of the detail of the report, it wouldn't, though, be, we will have evidence, it wouldn't be appropriate to engage with a group to say how much do you think you need. 
as you'll appreciate, but we, we will certainly bring forward the evidence that we have and the information that Councillor Gannon has sought in terms of historical levels, what inflation would mean and also what other uh, contributions the Council has made as well over the years. OK, and Seamus. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of points. Um, I believe uh, I'm very sympathetic to this here, uh, just to start off with, but uh, I'm I'm conscious as DFC uh, gives funding for for this as well, and I know the council gives a, an awful lot of funding. Uh, but I, I believe there be a liaison between uh, from Ananoma District Council and the two uh, groups in Anaskill and Anoma. Has this uh, deficit of funding been relayed to Fermanagh Noma District Council, or is this the first we we are hearing of it? Chair, I'll maybe again just defer to, to my colleague, um, Director of Community and Wellbeing. Certainly, it's the first that I've been uh, officially made aware of it. I do think um, each year there is an ongoing demand on advice services generally, and the feedback that we would be receiving informally on, from both organisations is that they could always do with more funding. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we have certainly not received any formal request that that matter be reviewed or considered. John? Yeah, Chair, if I can just state, we, we've certainly received nothing formal from Community Advice for Mana. Um, indications from, because we do fund uh, the uh, as a consortium, both organisations as one, uh, Community Advice for Mana and OMA Independent Advice Services. Um, indications from OMA uh, uh, or the Advice Services in OMA is that they wouldn't be under the same pressure as what Community Advice for Mana uh, say they are under. Uh, just in relation to the funding model that we have, we provide currently um, 265,000 to the uh, Advice Consortium. We provide 73% of that from our own council funds, 193,000 of that 265,000 comes from FODC. And that is the second highest of all councils in Northern Ireland that is provided from council owned funds and is the highest per uh, head of population uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, so I suppose we, we will take account of that in, 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 the, in the further report, which is brought before members. Okay, thanks, John. Ha have I a seconder for Adam's proposal? Bernard? I second Adam's proposal. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bernard. Are we in agreement, members? Report will be brought. Okay, thank you. Moving on, anything else on four? Five? Six and seven. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, Planning Committee, Wednesday, 18th of October. And for accuracy, first, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. John? Uh, again, in the absence of Councillor Evan, I propose the noting of the, or the adoption of the minutes of the meeting. Okay. Thanks, John. And a seconder, Alan? Okay, moving to matters arising, page one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. Okay, we're going to move on to item number seventeen, and that's to consider a delegation of council powers to the following committees in November. And first of all, Environmental Services Committee to consider a report on draft response to consultation on the proposed ban of manufacture, supply, and sale of wet wipes containing plastic. A proposer and a seconder, uh, Stephen, thank you, and Roy, thank you. And our second one then is a Regeneration Community Committee to consider a report on draft response to the consultation on the approach to 10X technologies and clusters. Proposer, Earl, thank you. And a seconder, Marty, thank you. Okay, that brings us to correspondence. And our first piece of correspondence there is to note the e-brief correspondence. Um, thank you, Chair. Chair, I know we circulated this to members uh, when received, but just the general e-brief that has been received from the, the Western Trust. Um, just specifically, Chair, in relation to the, the debt certification, we did obviously issue separate correspondence to the Trust on that matter following the Council meeting in October and the response is awaited. So really just for information. Okay, can I have a proposer and seconder? Diana, thank you, and Paul. Okay, moving on to our second. Yes, Chair, thank you. This is correspondence received from um, SOS Saver Acute Services, SOAS, and this is regarding concerns relating to the consultation on the temporary suspension of emergency general uh, surgical services at SWA. Um, so there's really a number of aspects to the, the information and the correspondence. Uh, firstly, the response, the concerns generally around the process, um, the decision making, the consultation itself, and then the reporting of SOAS's response to the consultation. Uh, and as members would have seen quite a bit of detail within the information. And uh, there is just concerns. I think that the, the five point plan in particular has not been given a uh, fair or appropriate consideration by the trust. Okay, members, can I have a proposal and a seconder to note? Adam, thank you. And John Philly, thank you. And moving on to 18.3. Chair, this is just the notification uh, again for information of an increase in court fees from the 1st of November and the details are provided in the correspondence from the court service. Okay, proposer and seconder to note. Paul, thank you. And seconder is Earl. Okay, thank you. 18.4. Yes, Chair, this is correspondence from the Locker and Landscape Partnership, LALP, and this is a request uh, for an informal meeting with the Council just to advise the Council of the progress of the partnership and the work it's undertaken, and it's something that traditionally the Council has accommodated, so imagine members would be willing to do so. Okay, thanks, Alison. Anthony? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'd like welcome uh, to have a meeting with the LALP and the, the great work they're doing in Locker and, and also the the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds here in the North. I also know they are doing great work on protecting birds on the islands of Lockhart, and so I'd be glad to propose this and look forward to meeting with them. Thank you. And you note the correspondent. Thank you. And Adam? Just a second, both of those chairs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We all agreed, members? Suitable date will be arranged then at that. Okay, moving to 18.5. Yeah, Chair, this is the notification of the Northern Ireland Energy Forum Conference on Wednesday, the 15th of November. Um, it, it, Chair, sorry, you know it's not on, on this information. I think the, the fee is in the region of £295 as the normal delegate fee, but I'll confirm that before the meeting closes. Um, it's just given the proximity of the date to the meeting. If there was interest, we would, we would uh, need members to express that. Okay, members. Have I? I'll just propose the note, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And Earl? 
You chair, second the noting. Okay, all agreed, members. Thank you. And then we have some other. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Just some, just in the other correspondence folder, we have one item of correspondence received this morning um, from C of Acute Services. So this is in relation to the uh, Council's invitation to the Special Council meeting, Chair. Uh, just in relation to the date of December the 7th, to advise that in, um, I suppose, my communications with the, with the group, I'd indicated that that date was currently free in the diary. It hadn't been uh, before members for approval, so that's just where the reference uh, for that date has, has arisen from. So in, in terms, the group have obviously considered our correspondence chair and are of the view that the um, the the format which has been afforded to them, which would be by way of a presentation, approximately 10 minutes uh, together with conversations and the trust being in attendance, doesn't meet their requirements. And as such, they have asked for the, the council to reconsider uh, the, the format. And I suppose really by third, halfway down the second page, um, asking the councillors whether it would be more appropriate to offer a direct engagement with members uh, as per the previous meeting. Um, so that's obviously something for, for Council's consideration. Uh, they also have highlighted, Chair, that the 7th of December is intended to be a, a, a public engagement event um, where there will be hopefully widespread political interest as well at SOAS's invitation. And that will be held at 7pm in the Westville Hotel and all are invited to that. Um, in terms, sorry, Chair, just in terms of considering the correspondence, um, so the council has a resolved position in terms of the format of the meeting. So that would remain the position uh, until a period of time would have elapsed or unless uh, we received a rescinding motion to that effect, which could obviously happen next month. So that, that's just by way of the, the logistics. OK, thanks, Alan. Uh, Alison, uh, John. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, we're happy enough that we look, seek a better date, more suitable for them, you know. But I'm kind of happy enough with the way we'd plan the meeting anyhow, you know, and their presentation might only last a certain amount, but there'll be engagement with them afterwards. So I don't see the problem with that. And there's no harm in having to trust there that we, if they give us information, we're at a later date during the meeting, we can, we can cross examine the trust on the information we've been supplied. I think it's a good enough idea of a meeting. So I'm happy, content to keep going with the format of the meeting and to get a date that suits them, because obviously the 7th of December is not good for them. And are you willing to note the correspondence, Sean? Thank you. Have I a seconder? Either or both? Uh, Stephen, you're seconding both. Thank you. Are we all agreed, members? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go to the uh, motion now. So uh, the motion is uh and i have a number of amendments uh so the uh, the motion is being proposed by uh dermot uh Castle brown and seconded by john john feely so dermot uh you have uh five minutes and the floor is now yours thank you chair uh i like most people i'm sure have been absolutely horrified watching recent events unfold in Israel and Palestine. Every day for the last four weeks, we have seen news reports of death and destruction in Gaza, news reports featuring mothers and fathers holding their dead children in their arms, news reports of desperate people sifting through mounds of rubble, searching for their loved ones. As we sit here in the Grange tonight in safety, we should think of those people who do not have the luxury that we have, people who will go to sleep tonight, not knowing if they will be alive by the time morning comes round. My thoughts are with the families of all those who have lost their lives in the recent violence. It's important that we condemn Hamas for the barbaric attack they carried out on the 7th of October. The deliberate killing of innocent civilians cannot be justified under any circumstances, nor can the taking of hostages, which is defined as a war crime under international law, all hostages should be released immediately. The actions of the Israeli military since October 7th have shocked the world. The Israeli military has embarked on an onslaught, the like of which we have never seen, against the people of Gaza. Night after night, the bombs fall, 
and day after day we read of the devastating consequences for the people of Gaza. Over 10,000 Palestinians have so far been slaughtered, 4,000 of them children, children that have no understanding of the situation, children whose only crime is that they are Palestinian. We have witnessed hospitals being bombed, ambulances being bombed, schools being bombed, refugee camps leveled to the ground. Israel has cut off the water and electricity supply to Gaza. They have prevented humanitarian aid from entering the region. The hospitals are in a state of collapse because they don't have the medical supplies to treat all the patients. We are not witnessing a country defend itself from an attack. Inc hospitals full of newborn babies and in incubators did not attack Israel. These are the actions of a government determined to punish every man, woman and child in Gaza. This is collective punishment. This is revenge. This is ethnic cleansing. Just imagine what it's like to be in Gaza right now. If a family in Gaza have their home destroyed in an airstrike, what are they supposed to do? I imagine for most of us, the first things we would think of is to get to safety. There is no safety for the people in Gaza. Gaza is an open air prison. The Israelis control who comes in and who goes out. Palestinians are not allowed to leave. The Israeli military told the residents of Gaza they should flee south where they would be safe. The Israelis then bombed the so-called safe zone. Many Palestinians fled to a UN refugee camp in Jabalia. The Israeli military then bombed Jabalia refugee camp on two consecutive days, killing scores of innocents. I'm now going to quote from a letter written by Craig Mockaber, who was up until recently uh, worked for the UN Human Rights Commissioner. In the letter, he said, this is a textbook case of genocide. The European ethno-nationalist settler colonial project in Palestine has entered its final phase towards the expedited destruction of the last remnants of indigenous Palestinian life in Palestine. What evidence is there that this can, is a case of genocide? All we have to do is listen to the Israeli politicians who have themselves made genocidal statements. The Israeli defense minister called the Palestinian people human animals and called for a complete siege of Gaza. The Israeli heritage minister, Amihai Eliyahu, said, and I quote, the north of Gaza is more beautiful than ever. Blow up and flatten everything. After we are done, we will allocate the lands of Gaza to Israeli settlers. The same minister then said only a few days ago. 30 seconds, Chairman. Okay, I'll pass forward to the end here. So we have a motion here which is calling for the immediate ceasefire uh, and only an international call for ceasefire will bring the Israelis to heal. We are calling for humanitarian corridors and we are calling for the international community to work together for a true and lasting peace in Israel and Palestine. And uh, Chair, I've also submitted uh, an amendment which is calling for the uh, the for the Irish government to immediately expel the Israeli ambassador. Uh, the Israeli government has so far ignored all calls for a ceasefire and humanitarian pauses. So uh, all diplomatic and political levers need to be used to put pressure on the Israeli government. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. John, you're seconding. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Dermot covered a lot there, so I'll just concentrate on really the number one priority it is a ceasefire. The U UN Secretary General is calling for an immediate ceasefire. The Irish government has led world governments in calling for a ceasefire. Uh, Amnesty, Tokyo, Oxfam, Save the Children, Medicine Sans Frontier, Medical Aid for Palestinians, amongst many other charities, are all calling for immediate ceasefire. Jewish Voice for Peace are calling for a ceasefire. John Taylor, former deputy leader of the UUP and a man that I don't agree with too often, is also calling for a ceasefire. We could speak here a lot, but I'm going to actually quote some of those people I've just mentioned here, just so you understand the world is calling for a ceasefire. UN Secretary General Antonio Guerreras, whilst calling for a ceasefire, said, and I quote, Gaza is becoming a graveyard for children. 
medical aid for Palestine, for Palestinians, uh, a London-based charity that are working on the ground in, in Gaza, released this statement just eight hours ago. The Ranitzi Hospital in Gaza, the only hospital that provides specialised services to children, has just been told to evacuate its staff as the building will soon be destroyed by Israeli forces. This terrible threat puts even more children at risk of death and injury. Save the children, and I quote, there must be a ceasefire. Without one, children who aren't killed will have their only their last reserves of hope fully destroyed. Amnesty International calling for in a ceasefire said, and then quote, I quote, in the face of unfettered devastation and suffering, humanity must prevail. Demand a ceasefire by all parties to end civilian suffering. Act now. The Jewish Voice for People, and I quote, we're calling for an immediate ceasefire and the release of all hostages and political prisoners. John Taylor, and I quote, the Israeli slaughter of innocent Palestinian children must end. That's the end of the quotes. All op 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 options must be deployed to achieve ceasefires, to achieve the immediate release of all hostages and to get humanitarian aid to the Palestinian people. And I'd finally like to agree with Dermot and second his, his, uh, his amendment as well, because the position of the Israeli ambassador to Ireland has become untenable. The ambassador should be expelled immediately. And thank you, and I hope, hopefully everyone can support this motion. Okay, thank you, John. And as I said, a couple of motions in, and the first one is Dermot's, so I'm going to take Dermot's motion now, or Dermot's amendment now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Go take. So if you, you just, you just, it. yeah, you reference it. You just need to. But yes, to take it. Yep, chair. Just to just to propose the amendment that we've lodged for the Irish government to expel the Israeli ambassador. Okay. Okay. And John, you're uh, formally second that amendment. Formally second that. Okay, so that's formally being proposed in second. So I'm going to take a vote on that amendment. That that. So, have I got agreement on that amendment? Okay, so then I'm going to go to a vote. So, yeah, it's just going to take a minute. So IT will let me know when they have it set up. Sure. Yeah. Oh, it's already called, yeah. What's that coming up there? You don't don't have to worry, that's just the way in which they the voting will come across for us in terms of numbers. You see, so it's showing there's the numbers that are present to be on the brief side, that's all. So is the vote open now? Mm -hmm. uh, it is. So you need to sign in. And then so the vote is open. Yes, yes, twenty-one. Yes, I know three abstain. Nine, three. Okay. Twenty-one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, chair. So that vote is complete. So on the proposed amendment from Councillor Brown, seconded by Councillor Feely, there were twenty-one votes for. Nine against, three abstentions. So that amendment has been carried. Okay, thank you. And so that is the substantive uh, motion now. Okay. Just open the floor yeah. again. Just yeah. So the floor is open, member. If there's any comments, and there yeah, there is the other amendment. So. 
uh, they're entirely at anybody's discretion. And Mark? Thank you, Chair. I can present my amendment uh, before the Chamber tonight um, that this Council calls for an immediate ceasefire in Palestine and Israel and calls for the immediate release of innocent hostages taken by Hamas following the terrorist attack and calls for the provision of safe humanitarian corridors and further calls on the international community to work towards a true and lasting settlement, peace settlement for the people of the Middle East. And Council also deplores reports that anti Semitism has increased in Northern Ireland since the 7th of October attacks on Israel and sends a united message that such uh, racism is unaccept unacceptable. Um, I have noted as deeply concerning what is happening in the Middle East at the present time. Um, Hamas perpetrated a non provoked terrorist attack on Israel on the 7th of October, with 1,400 people being murdered and 241 innocent hostages being taken, including children. And just by population size, that would be equivalent of 270 people being murdered in Northern Ireland in one day. Hamas is an illegal terrorist organisation prescribed in the UK, the Republic of Ireland, the EU and the United States. And Israel has a right to defend itself and its population, as well as seeking the release of innocent hot hostages. The motion as proposed makes no mention of those people being held in Gaza without any promise of release. We know that Hamas engaged in crimes including torture against innocent people. So why would any country accept a ceasefire while that is continuing against its citizens? Civilians are used as human shields by Hamas, and there can be no justification for this. There's absolutely no moral equivalence between Israel Defence Forces, who are a recognised army that are pledged to abide by international law, and Hamas, who are a terrorist organisation who engage in terrorism. There have been innocent lives taken on both sides of this conflict. And everyone must regret that. It is important that humanitarian, cor humanitarian corridors are opened, and the international community should also monitor claims that Hamas have deliberately targeted these corridors in, in an attempt to pass blame. We should send out a clear message against anti Semitism. This should be unanimous and without any conditions. And no one should forget to attempt or overlook that the 7th of October was the single deadliest day for Jewish people since the Holocaust. Many, many Jewish people across the world know people who were murdered or taken hostage in this attack. We do not support calls for the Israeli ambassadors to the UK or Ireland to be expelled at this time, and we will not be supporting the amended motion in its current form. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Mark, a council began to say what is most all of this has to be said, so I'll second this motion. Okay. Thanks. Paul. Mark. Thank you, Chair. And I suppose I'll start and comments have already been echoed before, but we, we need we all need to agree and recognize that what's been happening in both Israel and Palestine is horrific. It's a human tragedy in which no one is seemingly safe, regardless of age or personal circumstances. I had hoped, however, that this debate, the savings debate, would have been balanced and a genuine discussion. And then unfortunately I saw a number of the amendments specifically relating to the ambassador um, and, should, and even a, an amendment from a party that last week whenever they were faced with the same issue either didn't support or oppose and now they're calling for that exact same thing now tonight but i do welcome welcome the clear acknowledgement from the mover of this motion tonight that the actions of Hamas were totally absolutely and utterly wrong i do however have to express disappointment that they're still selective in the condemnation condemnation of terrorism on the 7th of october 1400 people were murdered as Councillor buchanan has said this is the single largest death toll death toll of jewish people from the Holocaust 80 years ago, and it's the world's the world's worst terrorist atrocity since the US September attacks over 20 years ago. Hamas would have known before they fired a single shot and murdered a, a single innocent person that their actions were going to provoke a huge response. They would, equally, they would have known that before they kidnapped a single innocent man, woman or child, that the Israelis were going to go to every length to try to get them back. And yet, despite Hamas knowing that, they still went ahead with their October the seventh attacks, but we need to remember what Hamas are. They're not some group of legitimate ragtag freedom fighters. They're a terrorist organization that rules Gaza with an iron fist. There's not been an election in the Gaza Strip for 17 years. All opposition is crushed. 
often murdered, and equipping their terrorist activities has long been given greater pri priority by Hamas when feeding and supporting their own local citizens. So the question is, what would have been a proportionate response to the October 7th attacks? Only last week, a Hamas spokesperson was on TV still stating, and I'll quote, Israel is a country that has no place on our land. We must remove that country. And then when asked by the interviewer if that meant annihilation of Israel, he replied, yes, of course, before adding, we will do this again and again. Hamas obviously don't support a ceasefire. And the entire modus operandi of Hamas is to shoot and hide within the civilian community. That's well known and that's well accepted. Yet they don't have a front line. Their front lines are tunnels and rocket pads placed either beside or under civilian buildings and other critical infrastructure. So what choice do the IDF have? Hamas won't negotiate. A ceasefire realistically won't end the deaths as much as we all want and wish to see a ceasefire as quickly as possible. But humanitarian efforts must, of course, be stepped up. Too many innocent people have died. And I think it's a reasonable point for this council as a collective body to express our sorrow and our regret at any death. However, we need to recognize that Hamas, ultimately, in the event of a ceasefire, Hamas will run amok, will run amok. And therefore, Chair, in conclusion, whilst the motion has been greatly improved by Councillor Buchanan and Councillor Robinson, I'm not sure why they have, why they've retained the overly simplistic call for a ceasefire, noting Hamas's stance at the time. Because as I say... Okay, uh, Mark, you have time is up. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to now uh, put the amendment that was proposed by David and seconded by Paul. Sorry, proposed by Mark. Sorry, Mark. I was looking at David and uh, got the name wrong there. Mark and seconded by Paul. Uh, and so I'm going to, uh, John, unless it's the point you have been in. Yeah, okay. Just a point of clarity, the substantive motion now includes the line about expelling the Irish ambassador. Yeah. So by adding these two lines, it'll be into that substantive motion that they're being added, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you've heard the amendment proposed by Mark and seconded by Paul. Are we all in agreement? Did I hear a no there? Okay. I'm going to let Alison yeah, clarify. Yeah, I think it maybe just to clarify. So the substantive motion uh, which is now before members includes the reference to and lastly calls on the Irish government to immediately expel the Israeli ambassador to Ireland. So the amendments that are included from the DUP proposal will also reflect the inclusion of the expulsion of the Israeli ambassador to Ireland because that is now the substantive motion. Okay, so are we all clear now? Yep, so I'm going to put that again then. So we have the amendment by Mark Seconded by Paul. Are we all in agreement? No. Okay. We go to a vote then. A recorded vote. Let's take a minute. On. Once your yellow light yeah. comes on. Once the yellow light comes on, the vote will be open. So it looks to be it open. So we press it. Just leave the screen so Philip, sorry, so Adam can take a screen grab. Because he'll just need that part of it. But he'll let us know if we. Progress again in the box. Yes, there, there is one there, but I, it, it's. it's no, just, but for oh, oh, not, sorry. We, we have a couple source, but just. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, Chair, so um that the votes for that amendment are twenty one votes for, ten against, and two abstentions. So that amendment has now been carried. So the the text before you is the uh, inclusion of the uh, first amendment and the inclusion of the second two amendments. Then, chair, that is now the substantive motion. Okay. Just one sec. Just take it. Okay. Okay. 
And now I'm moving to Adam. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I'd like to welcome the motion uh, from the proposers and, and welcome the additions made uh, by both uh, amendments. I think they all can slot in very nicely together, and hopefully this amendment does also. Um, the attack by Hamas on innocent civilians was abhorrent. The images of these attacks were horrific, and they must be condemned in the strongest possible terms. Around 1,400 people were killed, and over 200 taken hostage by Hamas. Since then, Israel has begun a series of retaliatory attacks on Gaza. It is understandable that Israeli people wanted action to be taken against Hamas, but this does not give Israel the right to commit war crimes. Now, over 10,000 Palestinians lie dead, over 4,000 of which are children. As has been said already, the UN Secretary General has described, children, uh, has described Gaza as a children's graveyard due to the actions of the Israeli government. The Israeli government also demanded that one, the 1 1.1 million residents of northern Gaza should leave whilst at the same time they rained bombs down on top of them. Indiscriminate bombing, cutting off power, cutting off water, fuel and food is collective punishment and collective punishment is a war crime. And I firmly believe war criminals should be prosecuted. Those committing war crimes should not be welcome in the international community. The far right ministers within the Israeli government are saying things such as that they want to use nuclear weapons in Gaza, that Palestinians can just live in the desert or, or come to Ireland, and that Palestinian people are, are human animals. This language is clearly language of people who want to do and perform ethnic cleansing. This is genocide. This is racism. Violence begets violence. And it's important to recognize that Hamas hasn't always existed. It came into existence in response to the actions of Israel in Palestine. And the, those actions came from other actions. It's a complicated, com complex conflict. But an immediate ceasefire is needed and amb ambassadors for governments committing war crimes with no intention of stopping and without remorse have no place on these islands. The SDLP has always advocated that violence is not the solution and it achieves nothing but more violence. We've always stood with the innocent victims and civilians and without an immediate ceasefire many more innocent Israeli and Palestinian civilians will die. The amendment seeks to strengthen the original motion uh, and in this case, to write to both the British and Irish governments to expel the amb ambassadors. And I would like to add that I'm glad Sinn Féin have changed their position on this and seen sense, and that they'll be supporting this, unlike in some other council chambers. Also, I said that war criminals should be prosecuted, whether they be okay, from Hamas or Israel. And this adds to it, and just to recognise that a, well, a two-state solution is the only viable solution. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Adam. Bernard. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to second Adam's uh, motion. And um, if I could just add, you know, we learn from our own bitter conflict that the only way to heal a divided society is through a negotiated peace process that recognises the, the issues that exist on both sides and seeks compromise that will deliver lasting peace. The SDLP supports a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine and that must be the focus once the current violence is brought to an end. I'd just like to quote <coughs> um, words from John Hume during our own peace process. You know, John Hume famously said, you can't eat a flag. Both sides should work together, spilling their sweat for peace and not blood, breaking down the barriers of the past and will, and will not give victory to either side. It will be based on agreement and respect for deference. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Bernard. And Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think like everyone that has been watching on the news and switching from channel to channel and watching on Twitter or X or whatever you call it now, um, 
the absolute devastation that has taken place uh, in both Israel and Palestine. Um, the initial attacks um, uh, were devastating for the people involved, but let's not forget that there was hundreds upon hundreds of Palestinians also killed before October the 7th. This did not start until October the 7th. This year alone, I think it's something like 350 Palestinians had been killed uh, up until that uh, point. So uh, in the round, all of these deaths are tragic, needs to be condemned. Uh, but we, we I, I, yesterday, an Israeli cabinet minister, like, you just have to, it's almost unspeakable uh, that a, a, an Israeli cabinet minister would come out with a statement. This is supposed to be a democratic government. Um, he said that nuking Gaza is an option. They can go to Ireland or the desert. Gaza has no right to exist. Anyone waving a Palestinian flag shouldn't be allowed to continue living on the face of this earth. That's a government minister. And uh, when you see the hundreds and the thousands of pictures of little babies and small children being dragged out uh, dead from the rubble, I don't know what justifies that, and I don't know how anyone can make any uh, justification for it. What happened in Israel was wrong, but this is completely wrong. Then this is uh, someone said about the the scale of what happened in Israel, and uh, it was shocking. But if you take it here, the amount of Palestinians killed in the last thirty days would be the equivalent of six thousand people here. It would be the equivalent of two thousand children being killed in the last thirty days in the north. It is just shocking stuff. I believe in my lifetime from watching it, and I have watched a lot of the coverage of it, this is the worst I have ever seen. It is just shocking. Okay. Thanks, Seamus. And Stephen? Thank you, Chair. Over the last number of weeks, we have witnessed a humanitarian catastrophe unfold with vast destruction and loss of civilian life, and our thoughts are with all those who have been murdered tortured, been taken hostage, lost loved ones, and those who continue to live under the threat of violence and fear. And at the outset, Chair, I wish to be clear that in this diverse and shared society, there is absolutely no place for the poisons of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. As a community, it is vital that all people of all backgrounds come together in support of peace, human rights, and the upholding of international law across the world. Chair, the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas on innocent civilians in Israel was as repulsive as it was horrifying. The infliction of rape, kidnapping and summary execution was outrageous and the images of young people being gunned down at a music festival scarred and shocked us all for its sheer barbarity. However, whilst the country has a right to defend itself against such inhumane behaviour, the right to defend itself is not without limit. Indeed, it is defined as proportional to the armed attack and necessary to respond to it. Unfortunately, what we have witnessed from the Israeli government in recent weeks has not been self-defence but collective punishment on a scale that has devastated Gaza and destroyed thousands of innocent lives, many of whom have had nothing to do with Hamas. It is not enough simply to say that Israel must act within international law. We cannot ignore that to date severe and blatant war crimes have already been committed. Nor can we ignore the, uh, the context, which is that consecutive right-wing Israeli governments, and especially the current far-right Netanyahu government, have intentionally accelerated the illegal occupation of Palestinian territory, pushed annexation, and dispossession of Palestinian homes, incited hatred against Palestinians and normalized settler violence. We are clear the only way to ultimately end the devastating cycle of violence in the region is for the Netanyahu government to end the illegal 56-year occupation and 16-year <laughs> blockade of the Gaza Strip and dismantle the systematic discrimination of Palestinians in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. But that must start with an immediate ceasefire, the provision of safe humanitarian corridors, the release of all hostages, and an effort by the international community to instigate a process by which a just and long-lasting peace can be secured for Israelis and Palestinians alike based on a two-state solution. However, Chair, on account of how urgent it is that we secure an alternative to the present violence, we were content with the motion as originally presented. 
However, following the adoption of Amendment 1, we are deeply concerned that the spirit of the original motion has been undermined, as the whole point of calling for a ceasefire is to open up diplomatic channels, and so in essence we regard the amendment as having negated the purpose of the original motion. And whilst we agree with much of Amendment 3, unfortunately we must take issue with it on the same basis as it contains the same problem. And I'll leave it there, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Josephine? Thank you, Chair. And at the outset, I would like to uh, commend uh, Councillor uh, Brown and Councillor John Feely uh, for bringing this motion before Council. And I want to thank uh, all of those councillors who have submitted amendments uh, to the original proposal. Uh, and I feel that those amendments do add value uh, to uh, the original motion and also uh, the uh, amended uh, uh, motion as accepted by Councillor Brown and Councillor Feely. Uh, Chair, I'm sure, I'm sure you will agree uh, that watching the scenes uh, from the Middle East on our television screens have thrown us all into a state of near despair and despondency because it illustrates to us uh, the capacity that human beings have to inflict suffering on others. We were all horrified uh, by the Hamas attack uh, on innocent Israeli civilians, people who were seeking to live their life. And uh, the response of the Israeli government uh, does not, in my opinion, uh, meet the standards that we expect of a, a, a democratic state. Uh, the, the, the suffering, the pain, uh, the, the huge loss of life, including women and children, uh, the uh, failure of the Israeli government to properly protect the innocent civilians uh, uh, in Gaza, in my opinion, is wholly unsatisfactory and unacceptable. So what do we do uh, as a civilised society to support uh, the civilians living in Gaza and in Israel? I think we have to protest in the strongest possible manner. We have to demonstrate that the behaviour of both Hamas and the Israeli government is totally unacceptable. And the pejorative language that has been used adds uh, insult to injury and again, totally unacceptable in a civilised society. So I think uh, that it appalls me that a nation that had suffered so much uh, uh, in the Holocaust have uh, with impunity delivered similar suffering on the people of Gaza, simply horrifies me. I normally would not support uh, the calls for withdrawal. Your time's up, Josephine. Withdrawal of ambassadors, but I think this is a strong form of protest. Uh, so I want to speak in support of the uh, Amendment 3. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Josephine. John? Thank you, Chair. The uh, the events of, of the, la the past 30 days within the, the Middle East have horrified most of the normal world. The, the slaughter of people, the suffering of the civilian people. And it's commendable that we are calling for a, a ceasefire. The problem is a ceasefire requires all the parties involved to cease firing. As well as Hamas, we have the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, we have Hezbollah and the IDF, all engaged in the slaughter and uh, the civilians always suffer because they don't have the wherefore and the means to get out of the way and they're just the side show whenever forces take each other on. We're calling for a ceasefire. We're calling for fulsome diplomatic efforts. And the first thing we're going to do is expel the Israeli ambassadors. 
And these are one of the parties that we need to be talking to. As diplomatic leaders across the world, we need to be talking to these people and to the other groups already named. Otherwise, it's not going to be a ceasefire. We can't just ask one side to stop because they're not going to do it. They're suffering. They think they're defending their people. The sim similar on the other side. We've seen it before, the cycle of tit for tat going on in our own country, and here we have it on an industrial scale. Because that's the only way to describe it, an industrial scale. And the only way it stops is if all the parties take a second, take a breath, look at what they're doing, see what they can do to stop it. We know that ourselves. So unless we engage with all the parties, so by sending them home and not engaging with them, I think we're totally failing. So we can't support any motion that's going to expel one of the parties that we need to be talking to. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, I'm going to put the amendment proposed by Adam and seconded by uh, Bernard. Uh, John, unless it's a point of thing. Sorry about this, but for my reading of this now, the last two lines of the motion, if we agree to it, one's going to be one line calling for the Irish ambassador to be ex excluded, and then the second line is going to be calling for the Irish and British. So can I just ask that they drop a bit of line just change it to and British governments and then and Britain yeah. to change our motion. No, that's so it's just for the tidiness yeah. of it. For the for the reading of the and I, I've spoken to Adam and Yes, Cheryl sure, was gonna but a ran short on time. Thank you. So that'll be just tidied up there if the if the uh, amendment is carried. Okay, so uh the amendments been proposed by Adam and seconded by Bernard. Are we all in agreement? No? Okay. Uh, can we have a vote then set up, please? Thank you. Are we all in there? I thought there was 33. Wait, 21, sorry. 21, 10. 21, 4, 10. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Chair, thank you. So the votes on the third amendment, there were 20 votes, sorry, 21 votes for, 10 votes against, and two abstentions which means that that uh, amendment is carried and becomes a substantive motion. Okay, Dermot, you have uh, two minutes if you wish to. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd uh, just like to thank everyone uh, who participated in the debate and particularly those people who supported um, our motion. Um, in terms of the, uh, the issue of the Israeli ambassador, diplomacy is always the preferred option, but the Israeli government have shown that they are not interested in diplomacy at this time, uh, so tougher methods are required to put pressure on them. Uh, I just few a few last minutes word just to say that uh, it's important that we are a voice as a corporate body to the call for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, I want to pay tribute to the millions of people worldwide who have taken to the streets, uh, who have organised boycotts and sit-ins, and who have shaken the establishment to its core. Uh, I would encourage all residents of this area to engage with the boycott, sanctions, and divestment movement. There are corporations who are in our district who are directly or indirectly facilitating the oppression of the Palestinians. Uh, and we must send a message that they will no longer be um, able to do this without consequences. I want to end my remarks by directly addressing the Palestinian people. Our thoughts are with you at this time. You have shown true courage and determination in the face of brutal inhumanity. 
you have proved that the Israeli, Israeli military has nothing in its whole imperial arsenal that can break the will of any Palestinian who does not wish to be broken. And you have proved that it is not those who can inflict the most, but those who can endure the most, who will win the day. Fermanagh and Oma stands with you. Ireland stands with you. Seir Shadon, Palestine. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So now we are going to move to a vote on the substantive change. Yeah, because that's that was the end of the speakers once the summing up was done there. So unless there was any point of clarification, but there, it's it's literally if there's a point, Steve, that's not you can't come in to speak on. Seeking your discretion, Chair, it's a proposal linked to the motion, but not you know, no. it's just it's maybe afterwards as to no. do with the uh, no. It's a yeah, we, Okay, well, I want to get this done and I want to get this. Uh, yes, you can take that under any other business. Um, so we're going now. Uh, we have this substantive motion now. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, can we set up a vote, please? Yeah. Yeah. It's cost 10 and we would have extension. Okay, we're at um, 21.10 and 2. Thank you very much. Chair, thank you. So the votes then on the substantive motion are 21 votes for, 10 against and 2 abstentions. So the substantive motion is carried. Okay, so that is carried members. We are going to move on to any other business. I'm going to uh, take Stephen in. Okay, Gorma, good. Chair, thanks for your indulgence in this. Uh, just following on from the passing of that motion, Chair, uh, Wednesday, the 29th of November, is International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. And I feel it would be appropriate, Chair, if we were to light up our civic buildings in support of the Palestinian people on that date. I make that a formal proposal, Chair. Okay. Have you a seconder? Debbie, you're seconded. Are we all in agreement? Okay. We set up a vote there. Twenty one ten. Twenty one ten. Twenty three ten. Okay. Okay. Alison. Oh, sorry. Chair, thank you. So the there were twenty three votes for, ten against. So that proposal is carried. Okay. And Stephen, did you want to nominate a colour? Yes, Chair. I'll go with red. Red's probably okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just I I let Alison come in. The other uh, piece of information that I want to share just as a by the way when we talked about IT earlier on uh, we are using or at least a percentage of us are using tech one and being able to record our mileage and so forth on that uh, the use of the uh, technology is greatly helping staff and they just wanted that passed on to you for those that are and encourage those that have yet to uh, master that technology uh, that they would very much appreciate the mastering of it and the use of it and it 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 gives you a lot of of added benefits there of being able to uh, go back over and see what you have put in and so forth uh, and and review uh, your own information so I would encourage the use of the tech one there for councillors. 
I'm going to ask Alison now just to address the other piece of business. Yes, Chair, thank you. It was indirectly uh, referenced earlier in the meeting, but the Chair in his capacity as Chair of the Board of Governors of St Kevin's College, Lisnesky, will be visiting China uh, later this week and, and for 10 days with a group of students. Um, as part of his visit, he has been invited by the University and through the Confucius Institute to also engage with the Mayor of Beijing and some other dignitaries and has been asked to do so in his capacity as Chair of the Council. So there is no cost to the Council and Chair's participation or attendance, but it is just in the context if there's some attendant media coverage that we would be uh, recommending, Chair, that you would have the opportunity to wear the, the chain during your visit for those specific occasions. Do I need that noted? Yep. Uh, um, Shemus? I would totally... Uh, <laughs> no, I propose that. I'm sorry. Mute that, Councillor. And have I a seconder? Uh, Nolene? Okay. All agreed? Okay, so it's a, it's a good opportunity, uh, members. Uh, I, I think that any opportunity we get to be able to uh, promote tourism and and investment into the council area. And I'm very thankful, I just want to put on record, uh, the efforts of council staff, uh, FLT staff as well, to be able to compile a video uh, for presentation of the tourism potential and then the investment potential as well, so that that can be shown and, and left with them when I'm over there. So hopefully uh, we might at some point see some benefits out of that, but uh, the first step has to be taken. Okay, so we're going to move on now to confidential business. So if we could have uh, Paul and uh, Glenn and
So IT will let us know when we're. Just bear with us for for a for a minute or two, members. We're just not finished yet. Okay, we're out now. So I'll ask the chief executive just sum up what happened in confidential. Thank you, Chair. While in confidential business, the Council confirmed and signed the confidential minutes of the Council meeting held on the 3rd of October 2023 and received an update on a legal matter. Uh, they also considered the confidential minutes of the planning committee meeting held on the 20th of September, uh, the confidential report at the Environmental Services Committee meeting of the 4th of October and the Regeneration and Community Committee meeting of the 10th of October. There were no matters arising from those committees and they considered the confidential report of the Policy and Resources Committee meeting held on the 11th of October. I uh, received an update in relation to an ongoing legal matter and agreed a further course of action in relation to this. Okay. Can I have a proposal? Josephine proposing, John Feely seconding, Tommy? Uh, go on, Margaret. Carly, just a point on the, the audio tonight. I know uh, I was suitably reprimanded for whispering in the background earlier, Chair, but uh, uh, it, it has become apparent to me tonight, and especially in the last conversation there, which I heard absolutely nothing of, because Mark was speaking sideways to the microphone, and indeed Diana came in, and likewise, and uh, several other speakers tonight have not spe spoken up, have not directed their voice to the microphone and quite a lot of the mumbling that went on the night. And perhaps that's why the whispering in the background was presumed louder. So I'd ask members uh, with your indulgence, Chair, to use the microphones and to speak out slightly louder, please, Chair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I suppose the other one is that we could try to see if, if our um, system is up to it's up to Chair, sorry not to digress but we have we've done the volumes we've done the testing it's the, the mics are very directional and so members do need or and officers indeed need to speak directly into the microphones but the the volumes and settings are correct and appropriate okay and and it it really does help and i appreciate that i that i uh, um mentioned it uh but it is important that we try to uh keep the noise level to a minimum so that the mics can be assisted. With that said, thank you all for your uh, cooperation and uh, wish you a safe journey home.